All right, let's fucking blast off. Let's do the dang thing, okay? Um, let's talk about it. Lex Fridman X Donald Trump 62 days campaign mania. Bro bro's talking about cars like we live in Mad Max. I mean, they're not wrong. American cabs are so fucking massive that it's like yeah, they they literally uh they they look their clearance is so insane that like yeah you can't see children in front of you like it is designed like a goddamn tank it makes no goddamn sense whatsoever but you know still sick yeah look up pedestrian deaths year over year yeah i don't give a fuck about your keyboard but toyota's the most anti-environment automaker if you want to cool off rotor get a rivian they're universally loved get an ionic 5 yeah i'm would you get the trail hunter edition or trd pro whatever the most maxed out version is Get a working class Lambo, Lamborghini tractors. Hell yeah. Why does it look so like scary? Why not the BMW EV? Um, the seven series Beamer EVs are actually kind of sick. I just don't like BMWs as a, as a whole. I just, I'm not like a BMW fan. The only thing, the only other thing I thought about was potentially the G wagon EV, but like, that's so just, I don't know. I, I just don't like Beamers and I don't like Benz's. I don't know. You, you need to get the trail package for the harsh roads of Beverly Hills. You think that's a joke? By the way, that ain't a joke, dog. Yeah. No, you literally need an off-roading. You need off-roading gear to be able to fucking consistently drive your goddamn car in Los Angeles roads. That's not a fucking joke. That literally is not a joke. Have you seen the motherfucking potholes out here, bro? I've gone off-roading with my brother. I know... I know what off-roading is like, and let me tell you, okay, as someone who is off-roading with an off-roader and someone who drives on Los Angeles roads, okay, there is not much difference, okay? There is not much difference between off-roading and just being on the road in West Hollywood. Yeah, going to the fucking gas station in Los Angeles is off-roading, dog. That's what it is. I don't do German. I had a Benz and German engineering sucks. What are you talking about? I had a Volkswagen Jetta back in the day. And I have a Porsche now. German engineering. Not all German engineering is equal, okay? Like, the, the Porsche uh, Volkswagen platform is pretty solid. The Audis are pretty solid. BMWs and Mercedes-Benzes are not. Don't call yourself a high-speed lover. I disown you for this car talk. I live in Los Angeles, dog. What the fuck do you mean? <laughs> That's a crazy thing to get mad over. It's like, yeah, I should just walk. Well, what happens when the sidewalk is over? Um, just walk on the street and just get killed. Anyway, um, Lex Fridman and Donald Trump sees two days campaign mania is upon us. Venezuelan gangs have overtaken Colorado. Wukong later in. Uh, okay. <sighs> Dude, get this absolutely insane. And Hyundai are actually killing it. Dude, I know. I know. The Hyundai, it looks phenomenal. It's just not out until. When did you give up styling your hair? I don't know. Does it look bad? I feel like it looks fine. I'm an Aussie used to be purple. All right, we gotta what? talk about this. The Ionic 5? Dude, I am not getting this car, okay? You are insane. I am not getting a fucking Hyundai Ionic, dude. That's crazy, okay? Like, look at this ugly ass thing, dude. I mean, listen, the Hyundais are decent. They have like decent EVs, no disrespect. But like, I'm not touching that, bro. Get the fuck out of here. Bro, this is literally like, you know, back in the day when the Priuses were first popping off, people would be like, oh, gay, like you have a Prius. Priuses are great, right? This is literally, this is way worse than that, okay? Best EV year over year. Man, I am not getting this shit, dude. Holy fuck, 459 miles? How is that possible? What? Oh, no, it's 134 miles with 72% battery. This looks like the new car for cottagecore lesbians. Bro, this shit, this, like, that is cr a crazy thing. Like, this is a crazy... Bro, say, get a Hyundai, dude. No, dog. I'm not getting a fucking Hyundai, okay? If I'm getting, like, if I'm getting an Asian car, it's gonna be a Toyota, motherfucker, okay? I am... This is a Toyota family, okay? This is a Toyota family, okay? Sorry, no disrespect to the Koreans out there, okay? You're crazy, best gay car to date <laughs> why i don't understand why they make evs look so ass dude I, like i don't i just don't get it i don't know why like ugh
Why does everyone sleep on Volvo? It's the worst car that my family has ever owned. My mom used to have a Volvo. It just, it's so boring. It's a car that you get when you literally want like safety over anything else. You have a family and you like really care about safety. Okay. That's the vehicle that you purchase when you got that situation. Watch this Jason Camisa Icon Bronco Raptor video. Dude, I'm not getting a fucking Bronco Raptor. Get out of here. People have said, I saw it. Bronco Raptors are literally fucking getting marked down by like 50 grand right now. Okay? Like, if I was an off-roader, I'd get like a Jeep Wrangler or something. Okay? Why the fuck would I get a Bronco Raptor? I'm not an off-roader. Exactly. Perfect time to buy one. Yeah, because no one is buying it. Because it's insanely fucking uh, priced up for no goddamn reason. You want me to buy a $100,000 fucking SUV when, like, it's not... Even on the off-roading front, it's not as good as, like, uh, a, a, a car that is cheaper than it. I am not going to get the GTI, GTI chatter. Stop. Okay, we're done. We're done with the car situation. Y'all are being annoying, okay? All right, well, let's blast off, okay? Here it is. We're blasting off. We're getting into the news. Oh, please, that's one paycheck for you. First of all... It's, it's just not, it doesn't make sense. Like if I'm going to fucking, if I'm going to drop a hundred thousand dollars on a vehicle, I want to get a fucking car that I actually like. I'm just saying that it doesn't even like reach the performance standards of like, I'm not an off-roader anyway, but even as an off-roader, it like is there's better off-roading cars out there. They're just literally listing cars to piss you off. Yeah. They're just like really adamant about the specific car that they like. Uh, social justy because of your car taste i'm convinced you need jesus in your life why because i said i really like the forerunner that's like the top contender right now okay well my big ass truck and my jujitsu classes make me feel all right about my small wiener who cares that i'm putting people at risk dude not my problem that's what i'm talking about dude These are kyler Oliveira investigates the venezuelan gangs taking over colorado let's go all right um do you ever regret telling chat things you want yes i when it comes down to like personal news um it, it is one of my biggest regrets honestly like telling chat personal news related shit gets heated real quick because everyone has like really just everyone has a lot of opinions okay google rich boy with more money than taste okay what is this did you guys know that the iconic this is like neither here nor there it's completely relevant but did you guys know that the iconic shelby was designed by a North Korean man. Like, straight up. It's such a fucking sick story. Yeah. A motherfucking North Korean man. Straight up with his family members in North Korea. Okay? Yup. Yup. Iconic 1967 Shelby GT500. And many other... The North Korean designer responsible for the 1967 Shelby GT500. John Shun could not have been involved in the design of 1967 GT350 and 500. This runs contrary to the uh, claims that he contributed to the design of the 1967 modern year Shelby's, as well as the coiled Cobra logo. The timeline does not appear to the timeline does not appear to contradict the claims he had influences in 68 and 69. Fred Goodall, Shelby's chief engineer at the time, hired John Shun to come work for Shelby immediately after Mr. Shun graduated from Art Center, uh, Art Center College of Design. According to Art Center's records, that graduation took place in 1967. According to the Shelby Registry, the first 1967 Shelby cars began shipping to dealers in 1966. By the time Chun arrived, 1967 cars and the updated Cobra emblem were already completed. The credit for the 67 range goes for a Ford designer, Charles McHose, who died January 31st, 2020. Mr. McHose arrived at Shelby in April 66, immediately undertaking the Herculean task. Mr. McHose was by all accounts a self-effacing sort of person, not one to speak the spotlight. Damn, this shit got debunked immediately. What the fuck? This made me sad. The rest of Chun's story appears to be true. He did escape from what would become North Korea, worked with the U.S. troops during the Korean War, and worked long hours after school while earning his degree. Art Center confirmed that Mr. Chun graduate was the first Korean. Um, it is possible some of his ideas were adopted for the early 68 advertising models, but more research is required in this area. So he, didn't he, so he helped. He didn't entirely design it. This editor's, this editor's note immediately disqual disqualifies the entire article. What the fuck? 50 years after these events, memories get tangled. The historical record can be incomplete. In this case, we're at least able to accurately state where credit for the 67 is due and where it is not. The loss of both men, each a contributor to a breed of legendary cars, is an erosion of history. We mourn their passing.
POV when I watch a streamer spread misinformation. I mean, I I also we collaborated and def uh, defected. I don't think he literally fucking collaborated. I don't know why it's making it seem like that because it seemed like he was very proud of his roots. Like I saw one interview. Um, I saw a readout of one interview where he talked about like how funny it is that he's like North Korean, and it didn't seem like he was like, God damn, look at these new emotes from Oliver. Holy shit, believer doubter. Okay. Get the motorcycle from Akira. Okay, dude. Y'all are crazy. We're done with the car conversation. We're done with the car talk. Okay. Y'all have lost the plot in its fucking entirety. Okay. I will not be purchasing a motorcycle, dude. What the fuck is wrong with you? Now you're being crazy. Okay. You're being extra fucking crazy. Yeah. Get a fucking, get a, get a Gundam, dude. Get Optimus Prime. Dude, get a spaceship, dude. What are you doing? Get a fighter jet. Get a fighter jet. Get an Eva. Get an Eva. Get a yacht. Get a yacht. Get a yacht. Get a yacht. Motorcycle. Yeah, dude. I'm going to get a fucking motorcycle so I can get killed. Hassan Abu Car nerds are fucking insane. This was the worst conversation to start. I know. It like knocked the wind out of my goddamn sails. I'm not going to lie. Because car talk is like one of those things where everyone has like very, very serious opinions, like very firmly held convictions that they will go nutty over. Oh, all right, let's start. Israeli protests are intensifying after execution of hostages. I mean, I'm just going to skip the Israel stuff and the Ukraine stuff. We'll get back to that later. Let's get started on Harris and Biden campaigning in Pennsylvania to court union workers. Donald Trump didn't really do a fucking Labor Day uh, spot, but he's back now. He's going to do a spot today. Let's start off with campaign mania. That is right, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get started. With just nine weeks to go, the battle for the White House is now a dramatically damn, changed race. Harris versus Trump with the current president, Joe Biden, campaigning for the first time alongside his VP, who now tops the Democratic ticket. She has a backbone like a ramrod. And she has the moral compass of a saint. This woman knows what she's doing. Harris in Pennsylvania using the Labor Day holiday to emphasize her commitment to union workers. When union wages go up, everybody's wages go up. When union workplaces are safer, all workplaces are safer. When unions are strong, America is strong. Noticeably off the train. Dude. If you can't recognize the difference between Kamala Harris's speech on unions versus Kamala Harris on any other issue, I don't know what to tell you. If you can't recognize the difference between Kamala Harris on unions versus the Hillary Clinton Labor Day speech that we watched, you are probably so oblivious. You don't realize this September and at the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. And that if you subscribe for $6 or for free, I don't know what the September benefits are. I still haven't figured that out. You will be able to avoid said ads. Okay, like I was genuinely surprised at how dynamic she was when talking about unions. It, it does strike me as one of those like weird areas of interest for her. Surprisingly, this is definitely a this is definitely a Biden era change for the Democratic Party where they actively communicate to unions, say labor unions, don't just talk about like workers, don't just talk about the middle class. I think it's good. It's a good change. We'll see if this change also means that they will, uh, you know, do things that make it easier to organize. But I think more casual people don't notice the difference and see mostly glossed over by who's doing the speaking. Still, um, it's a welcome change of attitude and a welcome change of, of pace in general. Did he watch the Lex interview? Dog, I just started. It hasn't even been an hour yet. I ran the first three minute ad break just now. Not disputing Biden admin, especially NLRB wasn't good for unions, but didn't unionization percentage fall under Biden? Yes. The issue, of course, is that these are historic trends. The existing unions also happen to get like pretty solid contracts under Biden, though, like historic contracts under Biden. But yes, the unionization uh, percentage is, is at an all time low. Huh. Trail this Labor Day, Mr. Trump, but attacking Harris on his social media platform, writing all Americans are suffering during this holiday weekend. 
Also over the weekend, the former president sparking new controversy by insisting he had every right to interfere with the 2020 election while repeating his false claim that criminal election interference cases against him are politically motivated. Whoever heard you get indicted for interfering with a presidential election where you have every right to do it, you get indicted and your poll numbers go up. The next major moment in this race, the presidential debate, now just one week away. Multiple sources familiar with Harris's preparations tell NBC News she's held a series of work sessions. This sucks ass, by the way. Kamala expected to unveil second key economic policy plank for New Hampshire speech Wednesday, focus on small biz and startups likely mix, including tax credit grants, technical assistance. Why does that suck ass? Because that right there is precisely, precisely what the Democrats always do. That is old school Democratic Party nonsense, okay? Here we go. Here we go, okay? Nobody, ain't nobody out there is ever going to get excited for fucking tax credits for small business and startups. It is boring as fuck. It literally sucks. It sucks. It's means-tested garbo. I hate it. I think it's bad policy. I think it's bad politics, okay? Straight up. Straight the fuck up. The issue, however, is that it appeals to the absolute worst, most annoying motherfuckers out there. So we'll be hearing a lot of people, uh, a lot, we'll be hearing a lot from people, the exact worst type of people in society, Redditors and the like, who love this type of shit, even if they don't have a small business, but they get really fucking annoying and technical about how like great this actually is. I think it sucks. It is poison. It is the exact opposite of like broad sweeping changes in the legislative agenda in the legislative agenda. For example, you know what helps small businesses? The way that Tim Walls talks about this is phenomenal. Paid family leave. Why does that help small businesses? Because now small businesses don't have to fucking compete against Walmart or other massive uh, ginormous corporations that can offer paid family leave, okay? That's how you help small businesses. Push for, push for broad sweeping legislative changes for all Americans and then angle it from the perspective of small businesses. Don't try to directly target startups and small businesses. It is unnecessarily divisive and it is also fucking boring. Lol at Walmart offering, uh, no, it's not, sure, Walmart doesn't fucking offer it. I, I, I know, but you know what I mean? Like there are large chains that are more competitive uh, that can offer better, that can sometimes offer um, better amenities to their workers in comparison to a fucking small business, okay? Huh. Yeah, yeah, this was really funny. This is a classic old school Kamala Harris one. This is like a, this is a banger. We made fun of this a lot in 2019. Yesterday I announced that as president, I'll establish a student loan debt forgiveness program for Pell Grant recipients who start a business that operates for three years in disadvantaged communities. Ah! As opposed to just doing student loan debt forgiveness. What the fuck? Why can't you just say student loan debt forgiveness? Like this was in 2019 when she was running in the primary. Terrible instincts in general. What a laughable fucking notion. I want to thank everyone for your feedback and clarify some confusion. We have an opportunity gap in our country, and one thing we need to do is support black entrepreneurs. I have a plan to do that on multiple fronts. It's also unnecessarily identity politics focused as well, which is annoying because like, dude, like this is not, this is not helping black people. This is helping like, like eight black people. Okay. <laughs> and you have unnecessarily tied like student loan debt relief to helping out like eight black people that might leave a age like uh might leave a fucking college and then go back to a community that is underserved and start a fucking podcast or some shit like it sucks yeah so stupid student loan relief for pell grant recipients is just one component of our plan to reduce the opportunity gap for black entrepreneurs along with 12 billion in direct capital we can ensure black entrepreneurs have a real shot at starting small businesses ben norton bernie sanders we should forgive all student debt and make public universities free by taxing wall street Neoliberal cop Kamala Harris, we should offer to forgive only up to 20,000 in student debt if someone opens up a business and runs it for three years. Like, 
What an incredibly bad idea. Anyway, this was like an old one. This was a this was a like an old terrible means tested like classic old school Democratic Party bad idea. Okay, Matt Brunick is also saying what I've been kind of uh, pointing to uh, for a while now, which is, you know, tax credits. Everything is a tax credit. Respect to TPC for uh, the Tax Policy Center for spending most of this piece on the administrative problems of this proposal. We need way more of that in the discourse in general. All these problems are solvable if you stop implementing this shit as tax credits, though uh, weirdly that's never on the table. It's not weird. It's because Americans are geared towards tax cuts. Americans and the Democrats are terrified of, of presenting anything as like spending money on Americans and only can only can angle any sort of political movement in the direction of less taxes. That's it. Okay? That's it. And it's very frustrating. It's fucking so frustrating. I mean, I've talked about this as well. It's just like, everything's a tax cut. Everything's a tax cut. Everything's a tax credit. You really don't have to talk about how to best mitigate all the problems caused by having the IRS run a welfare program. You really can just decide not to have any of those problems if by, uh, by designing it as a normal social security administration program. I mean, don't get me wrong. Whom among us does not like the intellectual challenge of how to do things in ways that don't make sense? I'd love to see a paper on how the Mine Health Safety Administration could run child allowance. But when it comes to doing actual policy, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Okay. It does make sense if you think about it uh, from the framework of like, I am terrified of ever fucking running a campaign that is going to just straight up give people money because I'm worried they're going to say I'm a communist and I'm worried that they're going to say, uh, you know, how do we pay for it? How do we pay for it? How do we pay for it over and over again? And I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to ever personally fucking deal with that uh, messaging problem. So everything's a tax cut. Everything's a tax cut. Everything's a tax cut. Anyway, there's more. Um, advisors have weighed, including parts of the care economy, such as paid leave and childcare patients and tax plans, e.g. billionaire tax hike in the upcoming push this week, but I'm not sure whether they'll make it in. Oh, so they're fucking not admitting. They're not putting in the good shit. I was surprised to learn that 62 million U.S. workers are employed by a firm with fewer than 500 employees. Oh, my Lord. This is the good part. This is the good shit. The care economy, focusing on the care economy, paid leave, child care plans, tax plans, inc including billionaire tax hike. That's the good shit. So they're like, they're literally coming out with the cookie cutter means tested neoliberal bullshit and, and not coming out with the actual good shit. Doing this shit also makes doing taxes without some stupid shit like TurboTax or a CPA impossible, which makes something like a single tax bill being sent to the Americans by the IRS even harder to implement. Oh my God. Oh my fucking Lord, dude. Ugh. I don't even know if, I mean, Dems are so afraid of being called communist, good Lord. They're going to be called communist regardless. Just do things that are good for people and communicate how they are good for people and how Republicans are lying. You can do that already. Okay. You can, you're doing that already. You're doing that already. You are forced to do that in every other aspect. Democrat, like Biden is calling her Comrade Harris, okay? Trump literally is calling Kamala Harris Comrade Harris, okay? Uh, did I say Biden? Sorry. Trump is calling Kamala Harris Comrade Harris. Trump says that under the Biden administration, America skipped the step with socialism and went to straight communism. These are laughable fucking concepts just laugh at it and be like these dumbasses want us to not give you nice things okay for far too long nice things have only been afforded by the federal government in the form of taxpayer funded subsidies to corporations and the billionaire class we want you to get a crumb of that there's a lot of you out there there's a lot more of you than there are of them but we want to and it's going to be somewhat costly but we want you to get something in return for all the taxes that you're paying for. Okay? They call that communism. It's utterly ridiculous because they don't want you to have nice things. Just say that because it's the fucking truth. Okay? Force them into a corner of engaging in, you know, deficit hawkish behavior 
that Donald Trump doesn't like doing. He does not do it because he is a populist. He knows he doesn't want to do that. He knows that that's poison for his base. Okay? It would divide his perspective. It would literally divide his base. If he was engaging in deficit hawking, it would literally cut across his own base of support. There are a shit ton of people who still think Donald Trump has their best interest in mind because he communicates that way. Kind of funny, just 2% of Democrats say Biden made the wrong decision by dropping out per Suffolk poll. 18% of Republicans say he did. Yeah. Is there an inherent reason why they won't engage in the truth? I understand Dems are terrible, but the current strategy seems like the same old garbage. Because the same old garbage seems promising now because it, it's got a new... It's got a new polish on it, okay? That's it. It's no longer Joe Biden, who is like a carcass, presenting the same old garbage. It's now Kamala Harris presenting the same old garbage, and she is at the very least like younger and more dynamic, seemingly. So they think that this will allow them to win a marginal victory. There is no, there is no interest in like making bold proclamations, running a campaign of hope and change, even if you're not going to fucking follow through on it, there's still obviously, there's still obviously a great benefit to running on it. Yeah, feeding hungry kids isn't radical. It's fucking human decency. There you go, dude. There you go. Okay. It's almost as if a lot of those liberals who are diehard loyalists of the Democratic Party will literally defend these policies on principle, but also... They'll reflexively defend these policies because it's the Democratic Party running with them. Let's play moderate game until we have the House and Senate, then fucking ram through as many progressive policies. No, that's not how this works. You're, you're failing to understand what I am saying, okay? You're failing to understand what I'm saying. First of all, they're not going to fucking ram through progressive policies. That's not going to happen, okay? And also, not only is that not going to happen... Running with progressive, running with a progressive agenda is not unpopular. This is a lie that has been fucking told by the Democratic Party to their base, okay? Absolutely zero people are like, oh man, I really would appreciate a fucking tax credit if like I worked in an underserved community for three years as a, as a small business owner, uh, as a Pell Grant recipient. That is unnecessarily complex. You're adding... That is the Elizabeth Warren to the Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders comes out and he's like, everyone needs health care. Y'all are ridiculous. Everyone deserves health care. We got to make this shit free. It would literally cost less to the government. It would cost less to the average American. Okay? At the end of the day. Right? That's it. Boom. Universality. It's simple. It works. It's great. Elizabeth Warren's like, well, you know, here's how we're going to actually do this. We're going to means test this proposal. We're going to make the military more green, yada, yada, yada. It's not simple. It's complicated. It's nerdy. It's unnecessary. Okay. Warren made Rube Goldberg ass palsy. Exactly. There's no reason to do any of those things, especially when, whether you are offering, whether you are offering like some tax credits to, to key constituencies that uh, you have identified are going to uh, help you win like maybe a marginal victory. You are losing out on the message regardless, and they're going to call you a fucking socialist or a communist anyway. You know? Fuck it. Put them on, like, fight for once. Democrats, fight for once in your goddamn lives. Put the Republicans on defense. You already did that, and that's why you had so much juice and so much momentum, and now you're cutting... All of that juice and momentum by running the most like boring ass neoliberal Hillary Clinton ass fucking campaign. Oh, I keep telling you guys, this shit is not effective. Okay. It's not, but nobody wants to listen to me. Everyone's like, whoa, shut up. Look at the polls. They're super fucking, they're golden. Polls look great. Polls are great. There's 62 fucking days remaining. There's still no fucking policies. There's still no policy proposal page. There's the first debate coming up in like 10 days and they have cut away at like a lot of the early messaging that worked that gave them a massive fucking boost. People in the Democratic Party from progressives all the way to moderates want the Democrats to fight. They want the Democrats to win. Okay. But if you run scared and you refuse to fucking fight against the Republican Party, and then you also capitulate to their framing on key issues like immigration, you're going to fucking 
barely win or maybe even lose. How are you still harping about zero posses when they started when they stated like half a dozen? Oh my god, dude. They don't have a fucking policy page. They don't have policy papers that you need to give to door knockers and canvassers. What the fuck are you talking about? Okay? You need a a you need policies on 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 paper, okay? That's how you engage in door knocking. That's what you give to your canvassers. This is just bad campaigning in general. Please stop. Don't worry, bro. They're definitely running the campaign of the century. What is this? Yeah, Biden knows better than anyone that Scoop Jackson's belligerent foreign policy, including the commitment to giving Israel a virtual blank check of America's support, has been losing ground in the Democratic Party for decades. According to Benjamin Netanyahu in 2021, Biden emphasized to him in a private conversation that domestic pressures were making it difficult to, uh, for Biden to be as pro-Israel as he wanted. Biden reportedly said, BB, I got to tell you, I'm coming under a lot of pressure back here. This is not Scoop Jackson's Democratic Party. That's awesome. Scoop Jackson died in 19... 1983 okay he died in 1983 he was born in 19 fucking 12 okay 1912 this ain't this ain't scoop jackson's democratic party jack you're telling me someone was named scoop yes brother because he was born in 1912 they don't even name motherfuckers like that anymore that's how old he is he's so old he died in 1983 do you understand what i'm saying Motherfucker was born in the turn of the century. They don't even name people like that. How many motherfuckers you know named Scoop, bro? It's from a different era. Back when they had soda jerks, okay? That's not a concept any longer, okay? Unless you're a fucking Mormon in Utah. I know it's a nickname. They don't name, they don't. Yes, dude, I know. His name is Henry M. Jackson. Uh, my point is, they don't name motherfuckers Scoop anymore. Like, they don't say, they don't just go, ah, Jack, all right, we're going to name you Scoop. That's right. <laughs> That's, like, not a thing. That's not a thing. Oh. Actually, just Henry. Dude, shut up. I know his name is Henry Jackson. Oh, my God, you guys are so fucking annoying. I'm saying they do not name, like, they don't give nicknames like Scoop and call people Scoop jackson any longer oh my god you guys are so fucking lame dude oh yeah yeah disappointing all around all right let's continue between campaign stops and her official duties unlike mr trump who shared the stage with president biden earlier this summer it'll be harris's first debate in nearly four years and no public events are scheduled today for either Harris or Trump, but this week does notably mark the beginning of voting season, believe it or not, with the first absentee general election ballots getting mailed out in the key battleground state of North Carolina this Friday. Savannah. Always good to remember voting is about to begin. Peter, thank you. Hey, thanks. Let's bring in our national political correspondent, Steve Kornacki, break it down. Let's start with the state of the race from a national perspective as we head into this final stretch. Yeah, here we go, Savannah. So this is the average of all of the polls that are out there nationally right now. And you see Kamala Harris, the vice president, with a three-point lead over Donald Trump. Two ways to look at this. If you're a Democrat, obviously you're happy you're ahead. And it's an improvement from when Joe Biden was the candidate. He trailed Donald Trump all year. But if you're a Republican, you could take solace in this. This is not unfamiliar territory for Donald Trump. Labor Day 2020, he trailed Joe Biden by nine. He almost came back to win that race 2016. He trailed Hillary Clinton by five on Labor Day. He did come back to win. So Harris has a, actually it's a tighter national margin. But as we know, these elections are determined state by state in these battleground states. So let's look at a state of the race there. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, numbers look worse when you look at the fucking states. When you look at state by state. Numbers look the best. Numbers look the best when you look at like the national average. You still need a plus five, okay? For the Democrats to win over the Republican Party, because there are more Democrats, there are more registered Democrats in this country than there are registered Republicans. There are more registered there are more Democratic voters in this country than there are Republican Party voters. Ultimately, you still, given the way that the Electoral College works, you still need around a plus five. Okay. And as you can tell right here, 2016 polls were a little different. Obviously, uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, overcorrecting that needed to take place for polling in 2016. Uh, Hillary Clinton's plus five didn't actually end up uh, helping her secure 
the victory. Through now seven battleground states. You can memorize this list at home. We're going to talk about them a lot between now and November. But the key here is that six of these seven states all went for Joe Biden in 2020. North Carolina, the only went for Trump. And you see right now, the polling is tight in just about all of them. Trump ahead narrowly in Georgia, North Carolina. Small Harris leads, except take a look here, like in Wisconsin, Harris on average leading by six. This is important to note. The polling was off in states like Wisconsin in 2020 and 2016. It underestimated Trump's support. Whether it does that again this time around, a major question. That made a huge difference, of course, in the in the result there. So let's do my favorite, Matt, the 270. Love to see how this can play out when you start switching how the battlegrounds go. Yeah, mine too. So we've got those seven states you just mentioned in gray here, the battleground states. Look, two perspectives here. If you're Harris, your most direct path is this. It's the call them the Great Lake states. Wisconsin, if you could win that, Michigan in Pennsylvania all went for Biden four years ago hold those and you see it right there Harris is at exactly 270 but here's the complication for her what if she slips up in one of these Pennsylvania she didn't pick that state's governor as a running mate some people wonder about that if she were to lose Pennsylvania it is the largest of these battleground states it's over if she doesn't look if she doesn't win Pennsylvania it's over okay like the reason why it's over is because if you lose Pennsylvania, the likelihood that you will win Georgia is incredibly low. Like, there's no pathway, in my opinion, where you lose Pennsylvania, but then you win Georgia. And if you lose Pennsylvania, you most likely lost Georgia as well. And in which case, it's fucking over. She's campaigning in Pennsylvania, right? Yes. You could see her number comes down. She would then need to win at least two from this Sun Belt tier. And meanwhile... If Trump were to get Pennsylvania, it opens up a, the simplest path for him. Get Pennsylvania, hold North Carolina, which he won in 2020, and then just win back Georgia, which he narrowly lost, and he'd be at exactly 270. All right. And Steve, you're not wearing khakis. You're wearing gray pants. Are you going in a new fashion direction that we need to be <laughs> That's crazy that they know about the fucking khaki kernaki, dude. You think they're Hasanabi watchers? Like, do you think there's, like, producers in the room that know? I mean, I guess we're not the only community that love the Steve uh, Steve Kernacki khaki. <laughs> yeah, I'm always very conscious of my fashion yeah, decisions here. You know morning. me, you know okay. me. All right, we're, we're on the journey with you. You're not the only one to bring it up. Yeah, a lot of libs love his uh, khaki Kernakis, too. Thank you very much. The Kernacki hey. khakis. Check, band appeals are probably there. All right, we got a new, we got a new uh, Harris ad. Focused, Harris Walls 2024. Not everything revolves around you, lol. Okay, first of all... I said this community, okay? Oh my god. I can't even fucking make a goddamn joke. I can't even make a goddamn joke without fucking 48 month subscribers like literally shoving it down my fucking gullet today. What is happening? Is it because I didn't pick your fucking personal favorite car in the morning when we were talking about it? Your viewers genuinely hate you, bro. Yeah, like literally. What the fuck, man? Yo, are you okay, dude? Are you all right? Are you all right? Is it is that what happened? Did I didn't fucking I didn't like the car? I didn't like the car that you wanted to suggest. You didn't even suggest a car. Is that a confession? Bro, we're just joking. I, dude, I already get enough. Listen, man, I already get enough fucking hatred outside in the real world. Well, not in the real world, but like online outside of this goddamn community. I don't have to fucking log in and get it. Eat dick for my fucking 26 month supporters. You know what I'm saying? Shit, dude. Calm down. Stop being mean. Literally, Russia hates you. I know. I got the fucking, I got the goddamn government of of russia making fun of me saying i'm gay any protein bars you recommend eh. west bruv that's why we're here uh, on my end i have a hard time coping because you called my car pick ass yes i don't like the bronco raptor i do like broncos though but if i were to get a bronco i'd probably get a resto mod like a the there's like ev resto mods that are pretty sick the problem is they are uh one incredibly expensive two incredibly unreliable but the old ones are so sick all right let's look at this new kamala harris we all know ad. costs are too high but while corporations are gouging families trump is focused on giving them tax cuts but kamala harris is focused on you building up the middle class will be a defining goal of my presidency she'll make groceries more affordable by cracking down on price gouging on and she'll cut housing costs by taking on corporate speculators middle class families build america we need a leader who has their back. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this message. 
troubling incident. This one. Out um. Yeah. The U.S. Marines. Uh. We'll we'll talk about that. But what is this? The Russians are not the only ones using your ads. What? Using your likeness in ads? It seems. Okay, dude. So looking at the poll stuff, do you think that she's gonna win? You made it sound like it's a little dire. Um, right now, if the election is tomorrow, she has a decent pathway to victory. Um, it's just, wait, what the fuck? Hold on one second. I had to, I had to do something. Stop reading the orange comments, you fatty. It's my dick. Have we heard anything else about the U.S. needing to have the most lethal army? I hope she pushes that more. It's really important. Bro, I would be lawyering up. You about to cash out? Oh. Tell me why Snopes bothered covering this. Because everyone is just in clown world, dude. And that's what it is. Whatever happened to that discourse that the war chest wasn't going to Kamala? Oh, yeah. Remember that? Another thing that they were fucking wrong about. Liberals always running scared and always being wrong. Incredibly consistent. Um, yeah. I, uh, what I'm trying to say is this. Okay. Right now, the polls do show Kamala Harris up. And I do still think that Kamala Harris has a pathway to victory. The issue, however, is the issue, however, is that there is no reason for, I found out on TikTok that Shane Gillis knows who you are. Sadly, it's not good. Um, that's not surprising. He's like fucking homies with uh, Sam Hyde and them. I don't think he likes me that much. I don't care. I'm, I'm still, you know, I give him props for being funny. He was on that pod with the one neo-Nazi with the glasses. Yeah, exactly. Do you think the uncommitted movement will cost Kamala Michigan? Um, well, I don't know. We'll see. All right. Um, Chad, did he beat the tiger yesterday? I did. I did beat the tiger's ass. <sighs> what was I talking about? God damn it. In terms of, in terms of Kamala Harris's uh, pathway to victory, okay, there is a likelihood that she will still win. The problem, however, is... The problem, however, is it's not supposed to be this close. It should not be this close, especially because Donald Trump is ass. He's running an ass campaign. People already have their people have already made up their minds on Donald Trump. OK, and not only are, have people made up their minds on Donald Trump, he's very clearly panicking and trying to literally secure non-voters once again, like inactive people that are eligible to vote that have not voted either ever before or have not voted for a Republican before, okay? That's why he has the RFK pick. That's why he's going on fucking podcasts. That's why he's trying to go out for younger male voters, okay? People that normally don't vote. This kind of movement will not be reflected in the polls, okay? So he's trying to pull another 2016 upset, basically. Now, do I think he's capable of doing that? Do I think there are enough people out there that will go, you know, I hadn't made up my mind about Donald Trump, but I really do think he's an outsider, independent voice who's, uh, you know, going to destroy the deep state or whatever the fuck. No, I don't think so. I think there are far more normal people out there who are just like, yeah, Donald Trump is chaotic. I don't really like him. I don't want to think about fucking politics. It's lame. But the issue is, the issue is Kamala Harris needs to communicate for those people. Kamala Harris needs to win those people over. Okay. There are plenty of still inactive voters, okay? I know that there were dual haters with the Biden-Trump uh, rematch, but there are still a shit ton of people that you could win over. That's a lie. I've spoken directly to Shane's podcast producer about you. They don't dislike you. Um, I, I, I don't care about this, okay? I feel like the Venezuela slumlord story out of Aurora is a plant. What do you think? Anyway, we're going to do, do the Lex Fridman pod. I don't know if it's in here. Is it out yet? It is. It's only an hour. I don't know if you know this. And uh, we'll we'll dive into this now. Lex Fridman, after doing four hours with Jank, Uncle Chunk, Uncle Chunk Weigert, did an hour with Donalde, okay? The Don. Um, it's not going to be a fucking uh, hour-long experience. What is this? Socialist Assam Piker is reportedly selling his new Lamborghini in a recent Twitch stream. He stated, I just can't own the same car for more than like a month, you know? Okay, guys, come on, please. Please stop doing this. People take this seriously. Like, we know that this is a thing that people literally don't care about. I think we've realized that people don't care about the truth, right? People don't care about the truth when they've made up their minds. So people will unironically deadass look at a fucking photo of me standing in front of a Porsche and be like, oh, he has a Lamborghini. 
and he's selling it. Like, they don't care, okay? So some people call you a fascist. Yeah, they do. So I figure it's all right to call them a communist. Yeah, they call me a lot worse than I call them. A lot of people listening to this, myself included, that doesn't think that Kamala is a communist. I believe you have to fight fire with fire. Politics is a dirty game. It is a dirty game. Oh, wow. Brilliant analysis, Lex. Thank you. It's certainly true. How do you win at that game? They suffer from massive Trump derangement syndrome, TDS, and I don't know if they're, it's curable from their standpoint. I think uh, we'd probably have a better world if everybody in Congress took some mushrooms, perhaps. First of all, what the fuck is this Joe Rogan ass convo, bro? What is happening? Are these cuts like... Is Donald Trump stoned? What is happening? Why is he so fucking low energy? What the hell's going on with this convo, dude? Medical marijuana has I been gotta pee. Hold on. Amazing. It's been Christ. I, I've had friends and I've had others and doctors telling me that it's been absolutely amazing. The list of clients that went to the island has not been made public. Yeah. It's it's very interesting, isn't it? The following is a conversation with Donald Trump on this, the Lex Friedman podcast. They're getting smaller and smaller. They're getting smaller. Right? I mean, pe people do respect you more when you have a big camera for some no, reason. No, it's cool. And about 20 guys that you pay a fortune to, right? All right. Okay. You said that you love winning. And you have won a lot in life. In uh, real estate, in business, in TV, in politics. So let me start with... Uh, mindset a psychology question what drives you more the love of winning or the hate of losing maybe equally maybe uh, both uh, i don't like losing and i do like winning uh, i've never thought of it as to which is more of a driving force you've been close with a lot of the greats in sport uh you think about tiger woods muhammad ali you have people like uh, michael jordan who I think hate losing more than anybody. So what do you learn from those guys? Well, they do have something different. You know, the great champions have something very different, like the sports champions. And, you know, you have champions in other fields, but you see it more readily in sports. You see it over a weekend or you see it during a game. And you see that certain people stand out and they keep, they keep standing out, but it's there for you. It doesn't take a lifetime to find out that somebody was a winner or a loser. And so the sports thing is... I'm going to warn you that this interview is going to infuriate you a lot. I mean, it already has pissed me off. It, it started off with a bunch of fucking silly-ass takes, so... It's very interesting, but, you know, I play golf with different people, and uh, you have... There's a different mindset among champions. There's really a very different mindset. There's a different... There's a different thought process. You know, talent-wise, uh, sometimes you can't tell the difference in talent, but at the end of a weekend, they seem to win. And it's very interesting, uh, like as an example, uh, Tiger or Jack Nicholas. he was... Uh, if Are you not a Trump tard anymore? Yeah, I'm gonna ban you. Six month subscriber, you can fucking suck my dick, dude. Like, the, the level of liberalism that you're demonstrating right there means that you are no longer welcome in this fucking community, okay? Sorry. It's just like, I don't want you in here. You're such a fucking annoying, whiny, little smarmy liberal, the absolute worst type of fucking liberal out there. Okay? If you've been a six-month subscriber and at any point, even ironically, you thought that I was like a, a legitimate Trump supporter, you're a smarmy liberal dipshit who fucking cries regularly because I, co because I criticize the Democratic Party. Um... You're exactly that same type of smarmy liberal dipshit that was like, we can't, we can't. You want Trump to win. That's why you want Biden to get out of the fucking race. Okay? Bill Maher ass, dumb fuck. No, I definitely prefer hogs to fucking dumbass liberals like that. Straight up. I can convert hogs. People that are like firmly, firmly planted on the, on the Democratic Party in the most like liberal ways possible. Like, if you come in here and you fucking accuse me of being a Trump supporter, you're lost in the sauce, okay? Phenomenal winner. And he does have a different way about him. And Tiger has a different way about him. And Michael Jordan. And there's never one... You would think that there'd be one way. Uh, Arnold Palmer was the nicest guy you'd ever meet. 
And then you have some champions that aren't really nice. Uh, they're just focused on doing their job. Uh, so you have, you know, there's not one type of person. But when I use a cup, it's because I'm saving the environment by not using a cup. The one thing I, I would say that everybody seems to have in common is they're very driven. They're driven like beyond. They don't seem to give up easily. They don't give up. They don't give up, but they do seem to be, uh, you know, they have a passion that's maybe more than people that don't do as well. You've said that politics is a dirty game yeah, in the past. It is a dirty game. That's certainly true. Uh, so if it is a game, how do you win at that game? Well, you win at that game by getting the word out and by u using sense. You have to have a feeling where it's going. You also have to have a feeling of what's right. You can't necessarily just go what's popular. You have to do what's good for a country if you're talking about countries. Or you have to get the word out, and you have to just continuously, like, for instance, you have a great show. You have a great podcast. It's very well watched, and I'm sitting here, and I do this. A lot of people see it, and I do other things, and a lot of people see that. And I go traditional also. You know, you have traditional television, which is getting a little bit older and maybe less significant, could be less significant, I don't know. But it's changing a lot. The the, uh, the whole plane of, of platform is changing a lot. It's changed a lot in the last two, three years. But from a political standpoint, you have to find out what people are doing, what they're watching, and you have to get it, you have to get on. I, I just see that these platforms are starting to dominate. They're getting very big numbers. I did spaces with Elon. What the fuck does that have to do with anything? they got numbers like nobody's ever heard before. What does this have to do with anything, bro? He's just he's just doing a reverse glaze. This is Donald Trump reverse glazing Lex and like independent media in general. So, you know, this is, you wouldn't do that on like radio. You wouldn't do that, those numbers, no matter how good a show, you wouldn't do those. That's idiotic. You're insane. Of course you do those numbers on radio. What the fuck are you talking about? And also, radio wouldn't have the same issues that Elon Musk ran with. Uh, Elon Musk had on Twitter. I really, really, this is so stupid, dude. It's so dumb. It's, it's so wrong. <laughs> Those numbers on radio, you wouldn't do them on television. You've been successful in business. You've been successful in politics. What do you think is the difference between uh, gaining success between the two, the two different disparate worlds? Yeah, and they're different, very different. Um, I have a lot of people that are in business that are successful and they'd like to go over to politics. And then you realize they can't speak. They choke. You know, it's hard to make a speech in front of that. And let's say you're talking about a big audience, but I get very big audiences. And, you know, for many people, it's virtually impossible to get up and speak for an hour and a half and have nobody leave. You know, it's not an easy thing to do. And it's an ability. But I have many people that are very, very successful in business would love to do what I did, and yet they can't pull the trigger. And in many cases, I, I don't think it would work almost almost for everybody. It's not going to work. It's a very it's a very tough thing to do. It's a big transition. And now, if you talked about people in the business and politics going into business, likewise, that wouldn't generally work out so well either. It's different talents, it's different skills. I have somebody who wants to go into politics so bad, but he's got a little problem. He's got stage fright. Now, he's a total killer, but if he gets up into a stage in front of people, he doesn't do well, to put it mildly, actually. I mean, he does badly. So you have to be able to make hard decisions like you do in business, but also be able to captivate an audience. Look, if you're a politician, you have to be able to speak in front of large crowds. There are a lot of people who can't do that. I've seen it. They can't even think about doing it, and they don't. There are many people in business right now, I could name them, but I don't want to embarrass anybody. They've been talking about running for president for 15 years, and they're very big in business, very well known, actually. And But it takes guts to run. Like for president, I can tell you, it takes guts to run. It's also a very dangerous pr profession, if you want to know the truth, but dangerous in a different sense, too. But it takes a lot of courage to run for president. It's not easy, but you have, and you know, the same people as I do, there are a lot of people that would like to run for president that are very, very successful in business, but they don't have the guts to do it. Dude, this is boring as 
fuck, dude? That's crazy. I I'm not alone in this, right? Like this is this got no fucking juice, dude. This has zero juice. It is so fucking bad. He's like, oh yeah, people are too afraid of running for president. I'm not. It's very scary. It's not boring at all. Really? I would love to examine your brain chatter. Holy fuck. I, I want to know. I want to know what has happened. Yeah, the Theo Vaughn one was like way more interesting because like uh, it's not worse than the other interview, but it does make him seem normal. No, the Theo Vaughn one was like interesting because Theo Vaughn is like an entertaining person and it unironically humanized them more, I think. This is just like fucking boring. He's like, oh, people can't talk in front of an audience for an hour and 30 minutes. It's like, this just sucks, dude. And they have to give up a lot. One of the great things about people from the business world is they're often great deal makers and you're a great deal maker. And you've talked about the war in Ukraine and that you would be able to find a deal that both Putin and Zelensky would accept. What do you think that deal looks like? I think the deal, and I, I wouldn't talk about it too much because uh, I think I can make a deal. If, if I win as president elect, I'll have a deal made guaranteed. That's a war that shouldn't have happened. It's terrible. Look, Biden is the worst president in the history of our country, and she's probably worse than him. That's a, that's something that should have never happened, but it did happen. Uh, I genuinely don't understand how, like, X conducts these interviews where he will just, like, say certain things. Like, I know he's, like, the only centrist in the country, okay? Like, the, the actual centrist, okay? Because he'll do this, and then he'll talk to, like, a straight-up communist and say the exact same, like, glaze and praise, right? Like, I'm 100% certain that if he talked to Kamala Harris, I suspect he would do this exact same thing. Like, he would say something along the lines of, like, you know, you, you did a great job uh, uh, as, as, you know, many people say you did a great job as vice president or some shit. You know what I mean? Because, like, it's, it's like a... Like a robotic formula basically the way that he conducts these interviews the thing is the thing i don't understand however is that like how can you say that with a fucking serious face that donald trump would be like you're the great deal maker like what do you mean what deals has he made dude he's ha he has like eight bankruptcies <laughs> what what can you name some of the great deals that he has made i don't think he's done any good deals at all how is Trump not a great deal maker? Explain. Okay, but how can you hate on Trump being a good deal maker? He left the White House much richer than he entered. That's a heck of a deal. Yeah, but those bankruptcy deals be banging. It just doesn't make sense. Happened, And now it's a much tougher deal to make than it would have been before it started. Millions of people. I think the number is going to be a lot higher when you see this all at some point iron out. I think the numbers are going to be the death numbers are going to be a lot higher than people think. This is the this is one of the things that fucking annoys the shit out of me. This is one of the things that annoys the living shit out of me where like Donald Trump can make these like bold statements. OK, Donald Trump makes these bold statements on a regular fucking basis and then there's no follow up. There's no, like, how are you going to do this? There's never even a, how are you going to pay for it? People have just completely caved on, on the, the issue. Like, he could just say whatever the fuck he wants, and zero people will be like, okay, that seems like a good idea. How would you do it? Like, nobody asked him this shit. What the fuck's going on? And, and it's wild, because, like, on the other side, on the other side, you got Kamala Harris can have, like, a decent policy, and immediately they're like, how are you going to pay for it? And then she describes like, you know, price gouging, which is vague still, right? And how they're going to follow through on the price, price gouging, um, like going after price gouging corporations and those promises. And then she'll give like a, like a wishy-washy answer on that. And then people are like, okay, well, how are you going to pay for it? How are you going to do this? Yada, yada, yada. Like there is definitely, if I am to, uh, if I am to, to look at it seriously, there is definitely a lot of advantages that you get on the Republican side when you're running for office in terms of like how much your policies are called in the question. Whereas like Democrats being the adult in the room, obviously get that adult in the room benefit uh, in, in terms of like the way people analyze them in the polls, uh, in terms of like the way people vote for the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party, but also simultaneously like they get a shit ton more scrutiny in general.
it is a little annoying to see that double standard in the media in general. Whereas like for Donald Trump, he'll say something one day and say the exact opposite a couple hours later and the media will report it as he just said two different things, but never like follow through directly on like where he lands on an issue. And they'll just kind of drop it because he has so successfully evaded ever answering a, a, a ever answering any sort of like policy related issues with a firm commitment, you know? He is more evasive than subscribers at the top of the hour when there is a three minute ad break. One of Trump's biggest deals was the Abraham Accords. Kushner said he ended the Arab Israel conflict in 2021. So he's a great deal maker. Yeah, it's true. He did do the Abraham Accords, which was great. Um, it's October 6, 2023. And honestly, uh, things are looking really good in the Middle East. Hopefully nothing crazy happens. <laughs> okay. As a hog, explain to me how the Republicans have an advantage. Leftists run the media in this country. Leftists run the media in this country. You think CNN is leftist, like as in socialist? Like you think liberal media, and there is a reality there, okay? Liberal media that refuses to have a singular fucking leftist opinion on. Liberals equals leftists. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad that you also recognize that you're a hog. And then you just doubled down and, and said liberals equals leftists. No, dog. Liberals are not leftists. Have you ever seen, like, who is the most, also liberals like to run the top of the hour ad break? Okay, shut up. I already ran the three-minute ad break. Okay? This is a sock account, obviously. Ugh. No two-parters. I mean, look at just what happened for this question. He was asked, what are the details of how you're going to get peace in Ukraine? He was just went, it's a bad war. Biden is bad. Next, no follow-up, no pressure. One of the only times where I've ever seen Trump be held accountable for his statements was... And this is like, this, this experience lives in my mind, was the Axios interview he did with Jonathan Swan in the midst of COVID. Do you remember when like Jonathan, when, when the Axios interviewer just straight up was like, okay, well, you're wrong. Um, here's how you're wrong. And he, he held him accountable for the statements that he made. When you're so far gone on the right wing, some center right news media looks like radical left. Holy shit. It ends up making good content in general too. So I think that like liberal media should probably do that a little bit more. And Axios is obviously center-right, by the way. Axios is a center-right publication. That's why Donald Trump gave them the interview, which was a mistake for him at the end of the day because he actually was held accountable. When you take a look at the destruction and the buildings coming down all over the place in Ukraine, I think those numbers are going to be a lot higher. They, they lie about the numbers. They try and keep them low. They knocked down a building that's two blocks long. These are big buildings. And they say uh, one person was mildly injured. No, no. A lot of people were killed. And those, there are people in those buildings, and they have no chance. Once they start coming down, there's no chance. So He's not talking about Gaza. He's talking about Ukraine. So um, that's a war that absolutely has to get done. And then you have this Israel, and the then you have a lot of other places that are talking war. The world is, is a rough place right now. And a lot of it's because of the fact that America has no leadership. And I believe that she'll be probably worse than Biden. I watched the interview the other night. I mean, it was just a softball interview. So you would like to see her do more interviews, challenged more? I don't know. I, I, I can't believe the whole thing is happening. We had a man in there that should have never been in there. They kept him in a basement. They used COVID. They cheated, but they used COVID to cheat. They, they cheated without COVID, too. But uh, you had somebody in there, and now we have a woman that is not, I mean, she couldn't do an interview. This was a really soft interview. This is an interview where they're given a multiple choice uh, questions, multiple guests. I call it multiple guests. And uh, I don't think she did well. I think she did very poorly. How do you think you'll do in the debate coming up? It's in a few days. So I've done a lot of debating, only as a politician. I never debated. My first debate was the uh, Rosie O'Donnell debate, right? The famous Rosie O'Donnell debate, the answer. But I've done well with debates. I mean, I became president. Then the second huh. time, I got millions more votes than I got the first time. So I was told if I got 63 million, which is what I got the first time, you, you, you would win. You can't not win. And I got millions of more votes than that. And uh, plus by... Damn, man. If only, oh shit, he's admitting he lost. It's only, if only there was like a, I don't know, like a crazy uh, world-changing global event that occurred that also 
that also caused uh, the the American government to to open up the way that people vote. You know, universal ballot registration, uh, universal registration, universal access, mail-in ballots across the board, which allowed a lot more people to vote. A lot more people to vote for the Republican Party, but also a lot more people to vote for the Democratic Party. A whisker, but and look what happened to the world with all of the wars and all of the problems, and uh, look what happened with inflation because inflation's just eating up our country, eating it up. So it's too bad. But um, there are a lot of things that could happen. We have to get those wars settled. We have to get. I'll tell you, you have to get Ukraine done. You, that could end up in a third world war. So could the Middle East. So could the Middle East. So maybe let's talk about what it takes to negotiate with somebody like Putin or or Zelensky. Do you think Putin would be willing to give up any of the regions they already captured? I don't know. Uh, I can tell you that this, all of this would have never happened and it would have been very easy because you don't have, like, that question wouldn't be asked. You know, that's a tougher question. Once that starts happening, because he has taken over a lot of territory. Now, I guess they're insurgents now too, right? So... You know, it's a little bit interesting uh, that that's happening and that it can happen. And it's interesting that Putin has uh, allowed that to happen. Look, that's one that should have should have never started. We have to get it stopped. Ukraine is being demolished. They're they're destroying a great culture that's largely destroyed. What do you think works better in those kinds of negotiations? Leverage of let's say friendship, the carrot or the stick. Friendship or sort of the threat of using the economic and military power? So it depends on who the person is. It's, uh, you know, it's, everyone's different. Negotiation's interesting because it depends on who the person is. And then you have to guess or know through certain knowledge, which is, you know, more important, the carrot or the stick. And with some people, it's the stick, and with some people, it's the carrot. Uh, I think the, the stick probably is generally more successful in that, you know, we're talking about war. But uh, the kind of destruction that we're witnessing now, nobody's ever seen. I mean, it's it's a terrible thing. And and we're witnessing it all over. We're witnessing it in, um, in all parts of the world. And a lot of things are going to get started. Look what's going on. He says the most basic thing, he talks like a child. How do people take him seriously? I don't get it. I don't think you understand. Like, one, a lot of people are just fucking stupid. Like, and he communicates to stupid people very well. The basic advantage that he has in this situation is that, yes, a lot of wars have happened under the Biden regime. Some are uh, directly the fault and responsibility of Biden in terms of its continuation. Others aren't necessarily all his fault, but he 100% can take advantage of that. Just like, just like Joseph Robinette Biden was able to take advantage of the fact that COVID happened under Donald Trump. Okay, holy fuck, this stream is an echo chamber. I love people coming in with like that. This is my favorite type of chatter, okay? This is what we need more of. I love this kind of guy significantly more than the annoying liberals, okay? Until he just, you know, chirps about some fucking weird racist shit. But like, it's great. Love that. We want this to not be an echo chamber chatter, so we welcome you in here, okay? We welcome your unique perspective, your unique framework anyway having said that however getting back to what donald trump is saying um he i think he does a pretty solid job uh if you are he i think he does a pretty solid job of communicating that like yeah i'm gonna be the peace candidate is that true of course not but does it matter no in terms of like winning uh the the narrative on key issues he does a great job in comparison to the democratic party which has completely lost the, the we are the peace party narrative. It's very odd. Detroit, Michigan judge rules Robert F. Kennedy Jr. must remain on the battle in, uh, ballot in battleground state. <laughs> Biden should remain as well. Yeah, that's not how that works, big dog. He, he was running for president. Biden was not. The DNC, the DNC needed to happen for the confirmation to occur. You can't just like put someone on the fucking ballot before... The party confirms who their candidate is. Anyway, Trump is quiet quitting. Trump does not have a single campaign event this week, according to his website. His next scheduled public appearance is Saturday in Wisconsin. Do those zins ever give you mad anxiety? Nope. And with China, 
Look at Japan. They're starting to rearm now. They're starting to rearm because China's getting, you know, taking over certain islands. And um, there's a lot of danger in the war right now in the world. There's a lot of, and there's a great possibility of World War Three. And we better get this thing done fast because five months with people like her and him, he's checked out. He just goes to the beach and thinks he looks good in a bathing suit, which he doesn't. Uh, he sort of checked out. Hey, look, you know, you can't blame him. That was a coup. They took it over. They took over the presidential deal. The whole presidential thing was taken over in a coup. He had 14 million votes. She had no votes, not one. And nobody thought it was going to be her. Nobody wanted it to be her. She was a joke until six weeks ago when they said we're going to have to, politically, they felt they had to pick her. And if they didn't pick her, they thought there'd be a, a problem. I don't know if that's right or not. I actually don't think it's right, but, you know, they, they thought it was right. And now, immediately, the press comes to their aid. If we can go back to China on negotiation, how do we have avoid war with China in the 21st century? Well, there are ways now. Here's the problem. If I tell you how, and I'd love to do it, but if I, if I give you a plan, like I have a very exacting plan how to stop Ukraine and Russia, and I have a certain idea, maybe not a plan, but an idea for China, because we do, we, you know, we're, gonna, we're in a lot of trouble. They'll be in a lot of trouble too, but we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, but I can't give you those plans because if I give you those plans, I'm not going to be able to use them. They'll be very unsuccessful. You know, part of it's surprise, right? Right. But they won't be able to help us much. So you have a plan of what to say to Putin? Yeah, I know. You take exactly. office. No, I had a very good relationship with him, and I had a good relationship with Zelensky, too. But I had a very good relationship with Putin. Tough topic, but important. You said lost by a whisker. Uh, I'm an independent. I have a lot of friends who are independent, many of whom like your policies. Like, Wow. So you guys aren't independent. Okay, got it. I love Americans and their, their belief that like, dude, so many Americans just say they're independent and then, and then turn around and be like, but I really like your policies. Like, what policies then? What policies do you like as an independent? The thing I will never understand is, I mean, I guess like they like the, the massive tax cuts that rich people got. Is that what it is? It's just people who are too embarrassed to admit they're Republican. Yeah. You can be independent and like someone's policies. Dude, the difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party when you remove all of the, uh, you remove all of the fucking flavoring is that the Democrats offer less tax cuts, but still offer tax cuts and deregulation. The Republicans offer broader tax cuts and more deregulation. But the major difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is that the Republicans will consistently say it's black and brown people that are causing your life to be shit, and we're going to put harm on them. We're going to do harm to them directly, and then that will magically make your life better, which it never does, but they still say it anyway, and they still make you believe it. That's the major difference. And it's not like the Democrats don't, continue along with policies that harm black and brown people either they do they just don't present it as like the major difference and that's the big difference between the democratic party and the republican party one runs forwardly with harm specifically to black and brown communities okay don't you think republicans do any policies that centralists can like what is a centralist you mean centrist huh what is a centrist like just dive deep into that statement because you're just kind of saying that because you've heard it before. What does a centrist mean? Okay. What does a centrist mean? Think about it. Like, what are you on the center on? Chatterers of Marxist Leninism hiding? No, it's just not like a real thing. People just say it. Okay. Lex Fridman is one of the only people. <laughs> yeah. Centrist is a person who is smart. Rights and lefts are both dumb and wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Stop illegal immigration, tax cuts, don't take guns, some policies are good, some are bad abortion. See, this is what I mean. It's like, one, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have just adopted the right-wing framing on this issue. Stop illegal immigration. The largest amnesty proposal ever given, the largest amnesty ever given to undocumented migrants in this US, on U.S. soil was given by Ronald fucking Reagan, okay? That's number one. 
Beyond that, it's not like the Democrats are pro-undocumented migration into this country any more than the Republicans are, okay? The real secret is that both parties are pretty restrictive when it comes to undocumented immigration. And not only that, but also that is what allows Donald Trump to say things like, we're doing child separation, but who built the cages? Barack Obama, which is true. Barack Obama did build the cages. Donald Trump used them. So ultimately, though, okay, neither party is saying we are fucking pro-illegal immigration. That's not a real thing. And neither party actually is. They're both very draconian, very restrictive. The reality, on the other hand, however, is that the reason why they are restrictive on immigration is so that there are people that come into the country knowing full well, we all know that they're going to come into the country regardless, okay, that we can abuse and use and hyper exploit even more so than the documented U.S. labor pool, which is already pretty fucking heavily exploited. That's it. That's the real reason why we have immigration laws in the in the restrictive white nativist ways that we have them. Okay, it's not a real one benefits from illegal immigration a lot more than the other, and it's pretty clear. What do you mean? Are you now going to run with this narrative that illegal immigrants are actually secretly voting for the Democrats? Is that what you're about to say? Because the only group that actually benefits from illegal immigration are capital owners. Capital owners who love talking about how undocumented Democrats definitely want the vote in the future. Really? You think undocumented migrants are actually getting citizenship in this country left and right? Is that what you think? And then those guys are then turning around and voting for the Democratic Party? They can't vote. Did DACA not happen? You have an issue with babies that were brought over the fucking border? That's like 500,000 total votes, by the way. And I don't even think DACA recipients can fucking, uh, like, can you even vote on DACA? DACA is 90% of, 90, DACA has 90% approval rating, which means Republicans and Democrats both agree that, yes, if you are a childhood arrival, they can't even fucking vote. But if you had child, if you were, a, if you came over the U.S. border as like a two-year-old, four-year-old, 14-year-old, okay, and this is the only country that you know, it is unimaginably inhumane to literally fucking ship your ass back to a random country that you have no association with. That's precisely the reason why, regardless of what you're saying in here, it's got 90% approval rating, as in Republicans like it too, not just Democrats, okay? But remember, you started off by claiming that you were a centrist, and now you're talking, now you're taking an anti-DACA position. Do you think that you're on the center of this conversation, or do you think you're on the far right of this conversation? So unimaginably far right that, like, you are literally outflanking the overwhelming majority of Republican voters in general when you say, uh, DACA happened. Do you even know what DACA is? Yeah, and no, you cannot vote as a DACA recipient. The Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program established in 2012 provides temporary protection from deportation and work authorization to eligible young immigrants. There are approximately 800,000 DACA recipients in the U.S. DACA recipients are not eligible to vote in the U.S., so you were wrong on that front, too. So unless you think there is, like, secretly a shit ton of undocumented and even, like, temporarily documented uh, but formerly uh, undocumented uh, immigrants in this country that are secretly voting and they're secretly voting for the Democratic Party, which there is no proof for, by the way, um, and only evidence to suggest the exact opposite. You're just running on fumes, running on right wing delusions. OK, where did this guy go? The irony, of course, is that especially when you look at like recent migrants, documented migrants in general and what is this? A centrist is someone who isn't deeply ideologically committed to conservatism or progressive and instead works to extract truths on either side cooks up. In my honest opinion, as a centralist, this person is a memer, by the way. I don't think they're being serious. Yeah. I didn't claim I was a centrist. I'm independent. I voted for Obama the first time. <laughs> was that not a pathway to citizenship? Thought it was touted that way. It's not. It just offers the opportunity for people who were brought into the United States borders as a fucking minor the opportunity to work, okay? The opportunity to get an education. They can't even leave the country. They have so many goddamn restrictions. You were wrong. Will this change your will this change your analysis in any capacity? Probably not. There should be a pathway to citizenship for DACA recipients. That's also pretty fucking uh, popular as well. You have to have a, uh, you cannot have any sort of criminal record if you're a DACA recipient. And
then you get, I mean, you're, you're heavily restricted. You can't even leave the fucking country. Um, there is an unimaginable amount of restrictions on it. You can go to college and, and work, though. So there you go. If you're a Republican and anti-immigration, you just need one trip to Florida to find out that it's illegal overstayers that brought their marriages that keep Florida red. I mean, there's also my best friend is Daka, you absolute piece of shit. You have no fucking clue how fucking hard it is on them. Literally every aspect of their life is restricted. Yeah. I'm a DACA recipient, and it is the worst legal way to grant undocumented people the right to work. I can't even work jobs that require residency. We need to reform now. Talk about it, Morris. I do. I talk about it quite frequently. Anyway, um, they pay taxes. They have uh, an endless amount of restrictions. It's complete fucking hell. They can't leave the goddamn country. They can't even have a smidge on their goddamn criminal record. Okay? Still, harder on immigration, tax cuts, no gun control. Yeah, bro. Your harder on immigration narrative falls apart the moment that you learn what the things you're talking about are. You're harder on immigration. Why? And you haven't even presented how Democrats are not hard on immigration. They are unimaginably hard on immigration. The real question to ask you is, why do you think immigrants that are coming into this country are actually harming the United States of America? Because they're not. There's no evidence to suggest that they do. As a matter of fact, they literally are the reason why we have been able to overcome um, the problem that many developed nations inevitably run into, which is birth rates. Okay? They keep the country young. The Democrats ran on Trump being scary for immigrants in 2020. What the fuck reality is this? The Democrats ran on Trump doing unimaginably cruel things to immigrants, which he did. The Democrats should continue running on that because he wants to do mass deportation. That means fucking SWAT teams doing dragnets in brown neighborhoods, okay? That is 15 million people living on U.S. soil that work jobs that is necessary for your survival, getting ripped away from their homes and being kicked out of the country and placed in concentration camps, okay? The real solution to the undocumented immigration uh, problem, when there is no real problem, is to offer them citizenship and document them and process them so they can participate in the labor force in the exact same ways that documented U.S. labor participates in the labor force. And also, you know, allow them to unionize alongside everyone else. Another fun fact about this, if undocumented immigrants were given legal status, tax contributions could increase by 2.1 million and the national tax rate average would uh, increase by 9 million. 15 million, no problem, turn them into citizens. Why do you think that there's a problem with that? Why do you think there is a problem with that? Centrist chatter, remember, you're a centrist, right? Or an independent. Why do you think there's a problem? Tell me exactly why there is an issue with documenting and processing all of those people. 15 million is a big problem. Is a big number. How is it not a problem? I have no concept. Of okay, stop LARPing as a centrist, Appa Papa Pachachu, or whatever the fuck your name is. Okay, you're annoying me. I'm already dealing with a real one. Why do I think there's a problem with 50 million people coming here illegally and given a blank slate? What do you mean a blank slate? How do you think processing works? And what is the blank slate? Do you have the? Do you think that automatically all 15 million people that have actually come into the United States of America are like, you know, engaging in criminal activity and don't say they cross the border. That is a crime. Okay. So was fucking jaywalking. Suck my dick. Give me an answer. What is the punishment for coming illegally in your plan there? Why should there be a punishment for coming here illegally in my plan? They've already suffered enough. You're not answering my question. What have they done wrong? 15 million people. What have they done wrong? Absolutely not. I'm just saying if you reward breaking the law, you get lawbreakers. That is ridiculous. You're still avoiding the question. What have they done wrong? What is the problem with migrants? Okay. You slap on undocumented or illegal in front of it and then expect people to be like, yeah, I agree with you. There's something wrong with that. Okay. What have they done wrong? Without undocumented migrants, by the way, you would not have an agricultural business in this country. You would not have any of the fucking treats that you currently get at the price points that you get. Okay, that's the other side of this conversation. There'd be no construction. There would be no fucking uh, agribusiness in this country. There'd be nothing. Okay, no chicken plants, no poultry facilities, no meat plants, nothing. But what do you think is the issue? What do you think they are doing wrong? Just 
Say it with your chest. I need to know. They enter the country legally. They artificially lower the cost of labor. Labor. They abandon their own country. First of all, they abandon their own country. You don't give a fuck about their country. Don't act like you care. Don't come in here with that cynical bullshit. They abandon their own country. Okay. Ridiculous. They enter the country illegally. Okay. Misdemeanor. Doesn't matter. Who gives a fuck? They artificially lower the cost of labor. This is the only thing that you brought up that is correct. However, there is a solution to this not being an issue. And I already told you what that is. Currently, as it stands, there's two tiers in the American labor force. You have the undocumented uh, labor force and you have the documented labor force. Okay. They pay into taxes. They don't even get the social safety nets that others can get. Okay. Like documented U.S. citizens can get. They would be paying more in taxes if they were documented. Okay. But not only that, not only that, you're right. The never-ending pool of undocumented labor actually does artificially lower the cost of labor. Okay? This is true. The solution to that isn't to purge the country of 15 million people. The solution to that is to process them. Okay? That's it. That's how it works. That's why I know I knew that this was inevitably going to come up, which, because it is true. The solution to that is to document them and allow them to participate in the documented labor force and unionize. Okay? It's that simple. The solution to control the flow of people in the country through visas and not take people illegally border hopping. If there was a more meaningful reform on the way that migrants get processed and refugees get processed in this country, no one would be illegally entering the nation. Okay? And as it stands, more than 50%, the majority of undocumented migrants living on U.S. soil are not actually crossing the border. They're not hopping the border in the way that you think. They're actually visa overstayers. So they're literally fucking flying into the country through the visa process anyway. But then the visa process ends up not offering them a meaningful pathway to citizenship. They should do that. Okay. Now, having said that, once again, you're talking about the solution to control the flow of the people without, without responding to what I just told you. They'd lower the cost of labor. Okay. That's a real problem. Then document them. Why do you have an issue with that? If your problem is that they are artificially lowering the cost of labor, which is not their fault, then the government solution is to not deport them, but instead to document them, right? What do you mean by document them? The only difference between an undocumented migrant and any other kind of migrant is paperwork. Chatter, that's what I mean by document them. I have a problem with it because it addresses a symptom of the issue and doesn't have anything to do with the stop flow. What do you mean stop flow? Why do you... What you still have yet to explain to me what the problem is in terms of migrants coming into the United States of America. Okay? You said there is... Out of all of the things that you brought forward, there's only one that is actually a valid concern. I addressed your valid point of concern. You didn't actually, you didn't actually have anything to say about that. And then you turned around and said, oh, but they're gonna, it's gonna, there's going to be a flow. There's going to be a flow of migrants. What is the problem with migrants coming into the United States of America? What is the problem with migrants coming into the United States of America? What is the problem? Just say it. You obviously have these very strong issues. You, you have these strong, firm-held positions you should not have a problem explaining exactly what it is. Taxes, lower wages, loss of shared national identity. Taxes, lower wages, loss of shared identity. Okay, let's address it. Taxes, you're absolutely wrong on. Not only are you wrong, I already told you, undocumented migrants literally give more to the system than they actually take out. So you're wrong about that. Completely wrong about that. Secondly, if they were documented, they'd give even more taxes to the system. As far as lower wages goes, we already addressed it. We already addressed it. The problem there in terms of lower wages actually stems from the government not really uh not really allowing people to unionize and take a higher percentage of the profits that they are generating for corporations okay 
it's the same principle for documented migrants, the same principle for undocumented migrants, it's the same principle for natural born US citizens, okay? Every single person, regardless of where they were born, has the exact same issue. Now, as far as loss of shared national identity goes, that is fucking hokum, okay? There are studies conducted on this as well. By second generation, every single migrant group that has come into this country has almost entirely assimilated to American culture. And by the third generation, there is virtually no distinction between uh, between any migrant population. At that point, they're also like American citizens as well, obviously. The United States is a land of migrants. It's comprised entirely of migrants in general, okay? From all different parts of this, uh, all different parts of this planet. Um, as far as like loss of national shared identity, that's ridiculous. That's not a real thing. It's a completely made up notion, okay? And you literally know people like this in your life because this is a land comprised of immigrants okay how many people do you think you know that have parents that are first generation how many people do you think you know that you talk to on a daily basis that have parents that are first generation immigrants you are currently talking to someone who came to this fucking country i'm a natural born u.s citizen because i'm an anchor baby but i came to this country at the age of 18 i am virtually indistinguishable from the average american but beyond that about 10 of my friends exactly would you say that they are not americanized Do, would you say that about 10 of your friends are, are contributing to a loss of shared national identity or 10 of your friends are completely americanized you grew up with these people you literally live this on a daily basis, but people in the media tell you that it's actually not the, the case. So who are you going to trust? Your own personal anecdotal evidence? Your own personal experience with people that you know? Okay? I would say the conditions they grew up in are a lot different than the communities being established today. No, dog. You are just being taught to believe that the conditions are different today. Okay? Yes, dog. Dude, don't be fucking... Don't be annoying. I'm treating you with respect and dignity. Don't fucking turn around and be like, yes, dog. Like you have, you genuinely do not have a, a fundamental premise that you're operating off of that is born out of the reality. You are literally experiencing reality. And then people are telling you that people are telling you something that is not corresponding to what your experience is. And now you are trying to make up for that contradiction by just continuing along with the falsehood. Your own personal experiences literally destroy this argument that you are currently presenting. Okay? Don't be fucking bad faith. Conditions are different. No, they're not. There is no difference in term. And by the way, there's evidence for this. There's studies on this. Okay? There are studies on this. By the third generation, with educational attainment, with job retention, and every other kind of every other kind of experience by the third generation there is virtually no difference between a migrant um uh you know someone who is two generations removed from like coming into the united states than anybody else okay as a matter of fact you probably are two or three maybe four generations removed from being a migrant that's it so many americans are quite literally, so many white Americans are quite literally four, five, six generations removed from being a migrant. Nah, I've been here since Jesus. What the fuck does that even mean? What are you, are you Native American? Like, what are you talking about? Or, oh my God, are you Mormon? <sighs> I'm a white guy. My grandparents were immigrants. I'm definitely 100% American. Yep. Anyway, there's a concern for animosity between ethnic groups in America, but that's stoked by insecurity and capital owners pitting groups against each other. Yeah, but ultimately, that, that animosity is like blown out of proportion too. It's ridiculous. Think about it. When you have these sorts of conversations, when you have these sorts of conversations with people, they, they come at it with these like vague generalizations and, and silly attitudes and it, it, and it completely falls apart. Truth is the greatest anecdote in this circumstance. It's actually significantly easier to have this conversation with people than you think 
just don't immediately call them racist or whatever and just work through work through all of these issues that they supposedly have in so many circumstances the truth will reveal itself like the actual position that they have will reveal itself or they'll agree with you at the end of it that's how it works like the fact that you're a deal maker like the fact that you can end wars but they are troubled by uh, the fact that you can end wars is crazy what happened in the 2020 election and uh statements about widespread fraud and this kind of stuff fake elector scheme what can you say to those independent voters to help them decide who to vote right. for? right i think the fraud was on the other side i think the election was a fraud bro you just said you lost dog what do you mean you said earlier you lost you can't now turn around and be like oh the election was a fraud and many people felt it was that and they wanted answers and when you can't challenge an election you have to be able to challenge it otherwise it's going to get worse not better and there are lots of ways to solve this problem go to paper ballots do it the easy way i mean the paper ballots and you have voter id and you have same day voting and you have proof of citizenship which is very important because we have people voting that are not citizens they just came in and they're loading up I live in a large immigrant town. There are a lot of new and old immigrants that refuse to adapt. Uh, refuse to learn or adapt or even learn English. I wonder about these communities. I'm Brazilian. I see this a lot in my communities. They even brought our material realities here with foods and brands from Brazil. How do you assimilate with these people in the communities? Can you unite? Bro, it's like talking about Chinatown. <laughs> you know what I mean? That shit don't matter. It's good that there's like remnants of, of uh, the culture that they bring here. Okay. That makes it better for everybody else. It makes the food better. It makes American culture better. The idea that they're not going to uh, assimilate to American culture is silly. It doesn't work that way. Even if they live in a cultural enclave, even if someone lives in a cultural enclave, the integration is integration is is a reality. It just doesn't matter if people are like, oh, I'm not going to learn. It doesn't matter. They still do. Okay. Especially by the fact that, especially by the second generation, when you have like, when you have a child that is an American citizen, a natural born US citizen, like they're just American. They're going to American schools. Like there is not, there is not like a, there isn't a, a situation where they're just like, nah, dude, I'm not like, uh, I'm not American. Are you in a rush to assimilate them chatter? No, I mean, there is no, people will say like, oh, they, they shouldn't assimilate or whatever, but like, that's not how this works. Okay. You need to have some semblance of like cultural unity uh, if we're if we're having a serious conversation about it, of course, that's what public education is about. And that's what the military is about. These are all factors at play that actually create a cohesive national identity. OK, we're not going to have like theoretical anarchists, no fucking borders, no boundaries type conversations at this point. OK, yeah. The greatest example is nobody makes that argument against Little Italy in New York. Thank you. Exactly. OK, you don't say that about that. Think why? Rolls. They're loading up everything. They're putting students in schools. They don't speak a word of English. And they're taking the seats of people that are citizens of our country. So, I gotta pee. Uh, look, we have the worst border in the history of the world. We have coming into our country right now millions and millions of people at levels that nobody's ever seen. I don't believe any country's ever seen it. And they would use sticks and so stones not to make it happen, not to let it happen. We don't, we don't do anything. And we have a person who was the border czar, who now said she wasn't really the border czar, but she was. She was the border czar, but she was in charge of the border. And we have her, and she's saying very strongly, oh, I did such a good job. She was horrible, horrible. The, the harm she's done. But we have people coming in from other countries all over the world, not just South America. And they're coming in from prisons and jails. They're coming in from mental institutions and insane asylums. And they're street criminals. Right off the street, they take them. And they're being given to our country. D drug dealers, human traffickers. We're destroying our country. This is a sin, what's been allowed to take place over the last four years. We're destroying our country. And we'll see how that all works out, but it's not even believable. And now you see, you saw in Aurora, Colorado, uh, a group of very tough young thugs from Venezuela taking over 
big areas, including buildings. They're taking over buildings. They have their big rifles, but they're taking over buildings. We're not going to let this happen. We're not going to let them destroy our country. And you know, in those countries, crime is... I wonder if Lex Friedman will go, hmm, is this true? Will there be a fact check on this? Nah. I live in Colorado. There's such a bullshit talking point. It's not happening. Yeah, good luck explaining that to people. You could be living in that fucking... You could be living in those housing units, okay? And people will still be like, nah, this is the problem. They put the ring cam pics on screen yet. The, the, I, I, saw, I saw the ring camera footage, okay? We were going to talk about this in a second. I tried to talk about this with uh, Jank as well last night, and he legitimately believes it. He's like, nah, no, it's real. Like, crime tourism is a real thing that's happening in America, um, and that it's real. He cannot be reasoned with on this issue. Like, he just straight up said it. Like, America does crime so much, we are importing criminals to do to do crimes and they are stealing our, our, you know, regular American born citizen crimes and cr from their, from the American born criminals. What would you say to folks arguing immigrants are a burden on our healthcare system? What healthcare system do we have? Number one, number two, no, they're not. Undocumented immigrants cannot take advantage of like any kind of fucking social safety nets that exist for very poor people in terms of like healthcare assistance. The only thing that they actually do take advantage of is the emergency room. And that constitutes 0.09% of overall healthcare budgets that the government is actually spending money on. So it's just not a real thing. Guys, every single number that right-wingers represent or, or right-wingers present when talking about undocumented migrants are not actually about the cost of undocumented migrants overall. Because in the cost-benefit analysis, undocumented migrants, given the horrifying conditions that they withstand in the American labor force, are actually putting in a shit ton more revenue into the system than they take out. They actually will cynically do this thing that is disgustingly racist, but is rarely ever, get, rarely ever called out. They factor in the children of undocumented migrants who are American citizens born on U.S. soil. They are American citizens. They will say, oh, undocumented migrants cost like $3 billion a year of, of taxpayer-funded like education, all this stuff. And you're like, hold on. Undocumented migrants can't take advantage of any of those things. How are they doing that? And then you actually dive into the numbers and you realize, oh, they're looping people in who are American citizens into the numbers, okay? So remember, if you hear like a massive number, Look at the data, okay? Look at the data. They're actually calling, they're lumping in documented, natural-born U.S. citizens in terms of, oh, here it is, yeah, the cost of illegal immigration to taxpayers. Immigration Integrity Security Enforcement Subcommittee of the House Judiciary hearing entitled The Impact of Illegal Immigration and Social Services. Illegal immigrants are a net fiscal drain, meaning they receive more in government services than they pay in taxes. This is a result not due to laziness or fraud. Illegal immigrants actually have high rates of work. They do pay some taxes, including income and payroll taxes. The fundamental reason that illegal immigrants are a net drain is that they have a low average education level, which results in low average earnings and tax payments. It also means that a large share of the quality for welfare programs often receiving benefits on behalf of U.S. born children. It's literally right there in the fucking summary. Yeah, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. What do you mean? Those are American citizens, dude. What the fuck are you talking about? What are you talking about? It is objectively wrong to lump in it is objectively wrong to lump in natural-born U.S. citizens into the drain that undocumented citizens are costing the United States of America. That's ridiculous. What the fuck are you talking about? That's not how that works. On a practical level, how would you propose the house undocumented migrants when we don't even have enough housing for citizens? We do have enough housing for citizens. You're delusional for thinking that we don't have enough housing uh, for citizens. Mass construction is a slow process. Even if there was the political will, meanwhile, the number of homeless continue to skyrocket. If you think that homelessness is a crisis born out of undocumented migrants coming into the United States of America and not because uh, not because housing is seen as an investment vehicle and many Americans that are homeowners want their fucking property, uh, want their property uh, uh, price to go up because it's like their only fucking way of accumulating any kind of fucking uh, wealth, then I got something funny to tell you. It's called public housing, okay? But yeah. 
You're saying that like, um, we don't have enough houses. You're wrong. We do. We have more vacant properties than we have the total number of, uh, total number of homeless in this country. That's number one. Number two, it is directly, it is directly a consequence of keeping house prices high. Okay. Every, there is no political will to actually fix the housing crisis in this country. Huh. But we need to build more. Dog, I just told you we already have existing units. We still do need to build more. You are right, especially in high density urban areas. Okay. But the problem is people don't want to do that and people don't want to build the actual necessary type of housing. Okay. Social housing. You forget that the NIMBY mentality causing affordable housing to be in places you don't want to live? No, it's fucking ridiculous. I don't care what NIMBYs uh, believe. Even if you do, they attempt initiative. NIMBYs make it impossible to do this building. You definitely see this in LA. There are 27.4 empty homes per homeless person right now in the United States of America. We should be building public housing that would single-handedly readjust the housing market. Okay. You see it all over the central coast to preserve the look of the city. Yeah, it's fucking bullshit. It doesn't matter. You can preserve the look of the city while simultaneously building, uh, simultaneously building higher density housing. Okay. But also it's not even just higher density housing. Like all the twist rumors gentrified LA. Yeah. We gentrified LA. One of the fucking worst housing markets historically on the fucking planet. It was the Twitch streamers that did that. Take the fucking, take the horse blinders off for a brief moment and be for fucking real, dude. Anyway, undocumented migrants do not actually factor into the conversation about uh, housing at all. It's ridiculous. What about the issue of people having mortgages? How to deal with the fact that a lot of people are hooked to their banks and it's a sudden drop in housing prices. People are literally bankrupt. Of course, people are wanting to profit and such, but it doesn't matter. But, it normally, but normal folk barely paying their mortgages will take the blow too, isn't it? Um... I think that that needs to be a readjustment that someone smarter than me will actually factor in. But overall, it's a fucking investment, dog. What are we talking about? People talk about their housing investment as both their shelter and also like the most significant piece of investment of all time. It's fucking ridiculous. This is what is really frustrating about homeowners in this goddamn country. If you want to treat your fucking, if you want to treat your house as a piece of investment, as a as an asset, then sorry, sometimes you might take a fucking hit. But for far too goddamn long, we have decided like, no, this will always go up. And now the inevitable consequences of this attitude, because there is a finite amount of fucking land and people are not making better use of said land, people go, whoa, 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 whoa what about my investment? Sucks to suck, dude. What the fuck do you mean? What about my investment? Ultimately, that land is finite. So your housing prices will go up again, okay? Fear not. You just have to sit in the house for a little bit longer. It's so frustrating, dude. A first house is a liability. A second home will be an asset. No, people still treat their first house as a fucking asset. That's the major problem here. Because people, even if they see their only home that they own as like shelter, in their minds, they got, in their minds, they associate it with a second mortgage that they could potentially take out of it or have taken out of it. Okay. That's it. Property value dropping doesn't change their mortgage payment. The amount they have to pay is locked in. Yes. Well, that's not true. Actually, they can restructure it, but that would be costly as well. Obviously you can restructure, uh, your, your, uh, loan payments. This is the, this is the secret side of why we never get any sort of, yeah, you can, uh, yeah, you can restructure your loan, you can refinance it, but this is the secret side of the conversation as to why, like, we never actually move in the positive direction in terms of, like, housing prices. Everybody talks about their solution to it, but nobody wants to have that tough conversation. Homeowners fucking vote, okay? If you own a home, you have assets, you're way, way more likely to fucking vote, okay? Not so secret. No, it is, it is, because we never have the, we never have the tough talk that, like, for example, for example, in California, 44% of the California population owns their home. That means 44% of likely voters, like which with a much higher likelihood of voting, straight up think, oh, this always has to go up. They will never, they will never in a million years appreciate if what they have taken for granted for multiple decades 
which is ridiculous. Like the way that their housing uh, prices have gone up ever goes down. They would lose their fucking minds. Oh. Did we finish the Lex interview or not? No, we haven't because he started lying about Venezuelans overtaking Aurora, Colorado. And it fucking annoys me to no end. But even before I could address that, there were chatters in here that were chirping about like how fixing the housing crisis is by purging the lands of the, the you know, uh, the barbaric, brutal force of, of Latin American migrants, you know, as though that's going to fucking work. It's an unimaginably costly endeavor that is insanely fucking cruel, would rip the economy to shreds, and it wouldn't even fix your fucking housing problem because it has nothing to do with undocumented migrants, dumbass. There is no lump sum of labor, okay? That's number one. And number two, more undocumented migrants becoming documented. What do you think they're going to fucking do? They're going to build new housing units. Way down. They're taking them out of their prisons, which is good because good for them. I do the same thing. By the way, if I ran one of those countries, any country in the world, I would make sure that America has every one of our prisoners. Every one of our criminals would be here. I can't believe they're going so slowly, but some aren't. And but they all are doing it. And we can't let that happen. They're emptying out their prisons and their mental institutions into the United States of America. We can't let that happen. So a lot of people believe that there was some shady stuff that went on with the election, whether it's uh, what media are bias you saying? or big tech, but still the... Bro, there is no difference between like, a lot of people believe the earth is flat. Why are you having this combo? You know? The claim of widespread fraud is the thing that bothers people. Well, I don't focus on the past. I focus on the future. I mean, I talk about how bad the economy is, how bad inflation is, how bad things like... Um, which is important. Afghanistan was, in my opinion, the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to our country. And because of that, I think Putin went in. When he said how, how stupid we were, Putin went in. But it, it was the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. I really believe that. Why is the voice of progressive telling me to vote for the blue war machine, Lamau? I still like you, brother, and anyone who's disillusioned by Uncle Sam and him betraying the working class, but even in the simplest way, Jill Stein, Howie Hawkins, and the Green Party would never drop the bombs, let alone supply them. Yeah, they would never drop the bombs, let alone supply them, because they're never going to fucking be president, okay? Biden and the Democrats genocided them. Why would you ever vote for that, let alone his VP? I don't understand what you're com where you're coming from, but as a typical fucking Howie Hawkins... Uh, Jill Stein defender I suspect that you're I suspect that you're coming in here with uh, I don't know look at their logs I suspect that you're coming in here with hallucinations okay I never once told you to vote for I never once told you to fucking vote for uh, Kamala Harris but I do find it very funny that you came in here you spammed this shit a million different goddamn times something that I never said um, and also your suggestion is to vote for Jill Stein. Go ahead, dude. Have fun with it. You know, the Aurora fear monger is so silly. Says intelligent. It's all just suburban people in Highlands Ranch or wherever who say they're natives and think immigrants are subhuman. The people actually invaded in the Denver, Denver metro area are rich people slash corporations driving up the housing prices. I live on the West side and still all my neighbors are immigrants. All my patients at work are immigrants and the most enjoyable parts of Denver are due to immigrants. Everyone spewing this stuff can eat shit. The Aurora gang takeover story is like another perfect example of how fucking unimaginably racist we've become as a country that we are so susceptible to like the dumbest, like the dumbest subject matter, like just something that is like, is there crime in a poor neighborhood? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. fucking -lutely. But do you think that a Venezuelan roving gang of migrant criminals came in and like, overtook an apartment complex like what the fuck are you talking about i still have unfortunately for chatters who are asking this question i don't know i don't have the answer for the the fucking um for the the photo the ring camera okay the ring camera footage of the dudes with like the dude with the fucking sniper rifle it's just that the local police say that it is not happening like so i don't really understand when you got the fucking right wing ass local police force that fucking literally wasn't Elijah McClain in Aurora. Like when those guys are like, yeah, dude, what the fuck are you guys talking about? Like, what do you think they're coordinating with the fucking Venezuelan migrants secretly? They're in the pocket. 
A gang is not running the Colorado apartment complex and tenants are not paying its members rent money, police said, despite speculation for the public after images of men carrying weapons of the building went viral. The Edge at Lowry Apartments of Aurora, Colorado have not been taken over by gang members. Interim Aurora Police Chief Heather Morris said in a video shared August 30, 30th by the department on Facebook. We've been talking to residents here and learning from them to find out exactly what's going on. And there's definitely a different picture, Morris said in the video. I'm not saying there's not gang members that don't live in this community. People paying their rent to gang members is also not happening, according to Morris. We really believe that they are sincere with us, the interim chief said about the tenants in the apartment. Aurora officials must counter Venezuelan gang hysteria perpetrated by dodgy U.S. politicians and media propagandists. It doesn't make any fucking sense. I guess the police chief has gone woke now, you know? They've made them gay and woke. Ay, ay, ay. Go back to the video, please. I know we're gonna we're gonna talk more about this Aurora gang shit in a second. Uh, I'll dive into it more extensively. Yeah, the police chief was taken over by a migrant. But you know, we left we left thirteen dead soldiers. Think of it, thirteen dead soldiers. Many soldiers horrifically hurt with arms and legs and everything else gone. Um, we left hostages behind. We left Americans behind. We left military equipment the likes of which nobody's ever left behind before billions and billions of dollars of equipment they're now so many subscriptions could have been given at the top of the hour to the hasanabi broadcast the hasanabi broadcast at the top of the hour folks three minutes of ads biden made it six dollars when i was president it was five dollars to subscribe now it's six bidenomics folks Billions and billions of dollars. You no longer want to see the Hesanabi broadcast ad break at the top of the hour. All you need to do is subscribe, folks. Here's the three minute ad break now. Selling the equipment, they're one of the largest arms dealers in the world. And uh, very sad, very sad. And, and, you know, we were there for a long time. I was going to get out we were getting ready to get out then we got interrupted by the election but we would have been out with dignity and strength we were having very little problem with the taliban when i was there because they knew it was going to be tough i dealt with abdul abdul was the leader and we got along fine he understood but you know they were shooting they were killing a lot of our people before i came down and when i got there i said i spoke to him i said you can't do it don't do it anymore we went 18 months before this happened, this horrible day happened. We went 18 months and nobody was shot at or killed. What do you think that was? The carrot or the stick in that case in Afghanistan? The stick, worked? definitely so the, the stick. So the threat of military force. That was the stick, yeah. It doesn't have to be, but that was the stick. Well, let me just linger on the election a little, a little bit more. For this election, it might be a close one. What can we do to avoid the insanity and division of the previous election, whether you win or lose? Well, I hope it's not a close one. I mean, you know, I don't know how people can vote for somebody that has destroyed our country. The inflation, the bad economy, but but to me, in a way, the worst is what they've allowed to happen at our border, where they've allowed millions of people to come in here from places that you don't want to know about. And I can't believe that that's going to be a close election. You know, we're leading in the polls. But you should be telling people not to vote for Kamala like you do for Trump. If you are honestly in support of Palestinian emancipation and the end of the genocide, I will never tell people to vote for Kamala Harris, but I will tell people not to vote for Donald Trump. Okay. If you want to vote for Kamala Harris, go off. If you think that you're voting for Kamala Harris to like stop the genocide in Gaza, you're delusional. I will tell you that every fucking day of the week. Okay. If you think like don't vote for Kamala Harris is like somehow in the interest of Palestinian emancipation, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. Like go ahead, you know, do whatever the fuck you want to do. Do you. Okay. But if you think that like uh, me advocating like, oh yeah, do not vote for Kamala Harris. Do not vote for Kamala Harris. Um, because you know, you got to vote for Jill Stein. Do not vote for Kamala Harris. Like dog, I've been around, I've been around the block many many years okay I've, I've covered multiple elections at this point all right let me tell you something jill stein was around as well back when i was 
covering the elections from 2016 to 2020, and now she's back. She's never around for local elections for some weird reason. The Green Party never mobilizes for any sort of, like, any sort of fucking uh, local elections where they could actually genuinely and earnestly, genuinely and earnestly fucking make a difference. Okay? We need to apply the pressure to the Democratic Party, otherwise they keep pulling the same shit. Yeah, see, this is new. This is a this is a fresh, young faced, new chatter. Okay. No, they won't. They're fucking delusional, warmongering, genocidaires. They do not give a fuck. Okay? They do not give a fuck. You watched the AOC TikTok? I did not. I've been talking about uh, the Green Party far before AOC chirped about Jill Stein or whatever the fuck. Okay, give me a goddamn break. They do not give a fuck. If they did, they would have literally given a fuck after the 2016 election. They didn't. They were like, oh, no, it's a Russia conspiracy. It's a Russia conspiracy. They just kept, they stayed the course. The only thing that I have actually ever seen, the only thing that I've actually ever fucking seen Mark Lamont Hill, a Green Party member, said the same thing, yet nobody got mad at him. What do you mean? What did he say? I'm older than you. The issue is every anti-two-party movement vote is fractured. If, if, if every anti-genocide voter who wrote in the same message would be reported on far more consequentially by CNN and everyone else. Yeah. The funny thing is, AOC helped with what was probably one of the most successful Green Party runs, Jabari's 29% against incumbent Lori Cumbo in 2017. Then he ran as a Dem three years later and won in a landslide so he could actually accomplish things. Green Party's L are mostly Democrat attacks. Wait, what? So let's focus on building a third party. At least they don't sell out as if Americans are easy to organize. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm, I'm writing in Biden, okay? <coughs> I'm writing. Oh, fuck. I'm writing in Biden. I'm writing in Biden. Oh, I just sneezed so hard. I got a fucking ab cramp. I'm writing in Biden. Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. I'm staying the course. I'm writing in Biden. Joseph Robinette Biden. His name will be at the top of my fucking ticket, okay? He's the only one. He's the only one bold enough and brave enough to defend America, okay? It can be true that Jill Stein is a grift and that Democrats are supporting a genocidal policy in Gaza. Not only can it be true, it is true. If this makes you despair, I only have one thing to say for you. Grow up. No one ever said change is easy. <laughs> He's right. I'm a Biden dead ender. At least with PSL, at least with PSL, they are active at the, and, and at the forefront of protests historically and forever. Okay. They're very good at organizing. They're very good at, at uh, community mobilization. The Green Party doesn't even do that shit. Shut the fuck up. Okay. I have a lot of respect for PSL in terms of all of the activism that they engage in. Shut the fuck up about the Green Party. They don't even do that shit. They don't even do that. Fuck. Tuesday. Them steal my sign. <laughs> Day Tuesday. Moment I bring up PSL. Day Tuesday's in here. Ready to rip. Ready to let it rip. As soon. As soon as I fucking. <laughs> Speaking of irrelevant parties, do you think the libertarians just like to be contrarians? I don't want to have this conversation about the Green Party. Please stop. Okay, please. Please stop. I can't believe we're having this conversation. Oh, my Lord. Okay. I don't know what AOC said about the Green Party. I don't care what AOC said about Jill Stein or the Green Party. I don't care. I don't care about the Green Party. Just explain to them why is it grift. I already did. At least PSL is at the forefront of activism and community organizing in this goddamn country. Okay. They have active chapters. There are literally people that are making those fucking placards. Okay, they're going to fucking protest. They're organizing protests. They're at the forefront of every fucking civil rights movement in this country right now. Okay, now in terms of local elections, they're not great either. They don't have a phenomenal track record on that front either. Those are the those are the places where you can actually fucking make a difference. What's up? Like there are examples of this. Yeah, you have the Working Families Party in New York City. You have the DSA. Like there are there are other political organizations that that work within the existing uh, structure. Okay. There are also people that are pushing the country in the, in the correct direction, okay? Pushing the country in the progressive direction. The majority of leftists that are pushing so hard for the Green Party are constantly criticizing the squad. Yeah, I don't, yeah, this is irrelevant. This is not like a real group of people and, and no real momentum behind it whatsoever. 
the irony is I regularly shit on the Democratic Party because they constantly take people's votes for granted. And the people that want the Green Party to magically win or something, even though they are comprised of like 0.01% uh, of the fucking vote overall that never actually end up voting regardless, they're all on Twitter, they're constantly chirping, they come in here and they chirp at me as well. And it's so fucking funny because it's like, dude, you're doing the same like, Vote for her and she will win ass bullshit, okay? If you vote for her, she'll win. No, that's not how this fucking works. They're not like Republicans or whatever, okay? There are plenty of well-intentioned people who end up going out and fucking voting uh, for, for the Green Party or whatever or for PSL. They're wonderful people, okay? But overall, it is not a serious political party in this country. I'm sorry, okay? These political parties and movement organizers, and people will shit on them too. They'll be like, oh, they work within the confines of the Democratic Party. They're fucking captive. But it's like, no, they do. They actively do try to get their fucking, uh, their, their, their policies across, okay? And it's a failure inevitably, but at least they're fucking getting more movement than the fucking Green Party is. I'm sorry. Oh, I think your take here is a mistake. My Palestinian wife literally Googled, who should I vote for if I'm anti-genocide? Seeing their growth in this community is missing the bigger problem that exists within progressive being able to use a Democrat any longer as a vehicle when it's been so disrespectful to Arab Muslim people. Yeah, if I was a fucking Democratic Party loyalist, you'd be right, okay? I'm not. And I'm not telling you to fucking vote for the Democrats either. Vote for whoever the fuck you want. But if you're going to come in here and be like, well, give the Green Party a real shot. Like, if you think I'm going to... Like, the very same criticisms that I have for the Democratic Party, I hold every fucking outsider group to the same fucking criticisms, okay? We're going to talk about electoralism. We have to talk about it like adults, okay? Like in a serious way and not in this like fabulous, hypothetical, exaggerated uto uh, utopian fucking worldview that you have that you're magically going to get your will across to the, uh, you know, broad majority of Americans, okay? Grow up! Mike is right. It's just like, it's, it's really, really... I don't know. It's just really weird. Like, if I'm holding the Democratic Party accountable, of course I'm going to do the same thing to the Republican Party, okay, which many people don't, like Glenn Greenwald, for example. Glenn Greenwald exclusively shits on the Democratic Party and then literally defends the Republican Party on a regular fucking basis because he's a grifter, okay? That's why you will never hear me not shit on the fucking Republicans, okay? Like, when people ask me to fucking offer unconditional support to the Green Party, you're asking me to fucking let go of, like, my critical perspective on an active political party, which is, you know, that's the biggest boost they're going to get. I'm calling them an active political party. Glenn Greenwald isn't a grifter. He's a mark. There's a difference. No, I think he's a grifter. 73% oh. of elections in 2024 went uncontested. If the Green Party was serious, it would behave like the British Greens after 2016. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a shit ton. Straw manning. I'm not. You should always pressure politicians due to establishment pressure. I agree. When have I not done that? If you think I haven't done that, ironically, you're straw manning, by the way, <laughs> my position. I think people can casually abandon the Palestinians because they don't have an actual connection with the oppressed people. It's all a game and not a matter of survival. Oh, my God. Okay, dude, you're right. Jill Stein uh, went to Palestinian protests, so she actually is there. She's there. Go vote for her then. Just don't come in here and chirp at me. I have not abandoned the Palestinians, okay? Oh, let's get back to the Lex Friedman interview. But, and it looks close, but I think in the end, it's not going to be a close election. What do you think is the right way to... Explain why you're not voting for anti-war Trump is a good policy. If you think Donald Trump is anti-war, you are literally the biggest baby of all time, okay? Donald Trump... Wait, what? Glenn Greenwald is not a grifter, Lamau. Are you pro-establishment or anti you are a Trump supporter who thinks Donald Trump, who was the president for four fucking years, is anti-establishment. I don't know how I can have a conversation with you. Okay? I don't know how I can have a conversation with you. Of course you don't think Glenn Greenwald is, uh, is not a grifter. You, or, of course you don't think Glenn Greenwald is a, a grifter. Donald Trump is a fucking billionaire real estate developer born with a silver spoon who quite literally was a president for four fucking years. Are you stupid? Do you have fucking brain damage? Do you know how many fucking war crimes he's single-handedly responsible for as the goddamn president? Every American president is a war criminal. Donald Trump also greatly accelerated drone warfare, so he's responsible for even more drone strikes than Drone King Barack Obama. One of his first acts of foreign policy was to drop the mother of all bombs, dude. What the fuck are we talking about? He assassinated Qasem Soleimani, a high-ranking general that was 
broadly popular in Iran in an unjustifiable extrajudicial killing, okay? The only reason why it didn't amount to a complete fucking warfare was because of the, the restraint demonstrated by the Iranian government on a regular fucking basis. Iran is dangerous. Man, you can't say you're anti-war, then say Iran is dangerous. This is why I'm so fucking frustrated with the Glenn Greenwald types who are like, yeah, dude, the Republicans are the real anti-war party. Like, eat a goddamn dick. Half the Republican Party wants to take away funds from Ukraine, okay, and then put it into bombing Mexico. What the fuck are you talking about? More anti-war than the current admin? No, the fuck he's not. Shut the fuck up. By the way, I don't even fault this dumbass, okay? Let me tell you something. This is how you arrive... You arrive at this conclusion, as do many Americans. Listen, this is a learning educational moment for every single person. You can only arrive at this fucking conclusion if you're obviously a little stupid, and many of us are, myself included, okay? But you have to understand, the only reason why Americans arrive at this conclusion is because Donald Trump at least presents an anti-war narrative, like he's a peaceful dove, like he did against Hillary Clinton, successfully, mind you, and he's doing again against the current Democratic administration. When you have Kamala fucking Harris get up there and basically sig heil in English by being like, we have to have the most lethal American military, of course people are going to hear that and go, oh my God, there's a genocide going on. She's in support of it. She hasn't said anything to fucking distinguish herself from Joe Biden and then uh, turn around and say stuff, stuff like, we're going to have the most lethal, hard-dicked military of all time. We're going to fuck all of our enemies in the ass. We're going to fucking do it all. Then, yeah, Donald Trump being like, I'm going to finish all the wars. I'm going to finish all the wars. I love peace. I'm a peaceful dove. Dumbasses obviously hear that and go, okay, I guess Donald Trump is the peaceful dove candidate. There is a reason why he says it. He's lying. Don't say at least he's saying it. He's lying. You can look at his fucking track record, dumbass. Fuck. Technically, Joe Biden actually did end a war. Afghanistan. Donald Trump literally shits on him on a regular basis for doing so. For demonstrating the courage to do so, by the way. Okay? What do you mean at least he's lying? You can't trust either of them. Oh, shut up. You obviously prefer one over the other. I don't. I don't trust either of them. I don't like either of them. I openly said I wasn't going to vote for Joe Biden, and I wasn't going to vote for Donald Trump. And who knows if I vote for Kamala Harris or not. Probably won't either. So shut the fuck up. You actually have a dog in this fight. You want to vote for Donald Trump. You want to hug Trump. You want to kiss Trump. You love Donald Trump. You think he's fucking a peaceful dove, okay? You have deluded yourself into thinking that Donald Trump is a peaceful dove when he is fucking, he was president for four years. You could look at him. You could look at what he did. Investigate a little bit further and make up your own mind after, you know, looking at the evidence. Ugh. Strikes on terrorists, Iran is good. Okay, so you're not a fucking dove at all, dumbass. Shut up. Strikes on terrorists, Iran are good. We are the terror, okay? We are responsible for so much more terrorism globally than Iran ever could dream of, okay? What the fuck do you mean? You are a terrorist. You are a defender of terror. You are literally saying we should do more terror by calling Iran the terrorist Iran. Trump says he wants to. What? What do you mean? He wants to what? Bomb Iran and you think that's good? How is he anti-war then, dumbass? You're not anti-war and neither is he. This solved the immigration crisis is... Dude, I'm I'm being on I'm being so for real with you. Like, you don't live in Lebanon, you don't live in Syria, you don't live in Iraq. If you don't live in that region, okay, and you legitimately think Iran constitutes a great danger to you, you are one of the biggest baboons of all time. Okay? Straight up. Straight the fuck up. You are literally the dumbest person I have ever encountered. Okay? What the fuck has Iran ever done to you? Okay? To try to think like, oh man, they're bad though, like because look at their domestic policies, and then you advocate to bomb them. What do you think will happen if you bomb them? Do you think they'll be bombed into being woke? Is that what you think is going to happen? Deportation, one of the solutions you would think about. Well, you've got to get the the criminals out of here fast, right? Yeah, you know, the people from mental institutions, you got to get them back into their mental institution. No country can afford this. You know, it's just too much money. You look at what's happening in New York and Chicago and LA and lots of places, and you take a look at what's happening. There's no country can afford this. We can't afford it. And we've got to get the bad ones out immediately, and the rest have to be worked on. 
You know, it's happened before. Dwight Eisenhower was sort of a moderate president, moderate type person, but he hated when he saw people pouring into the country. Dog is talking about mass deportations under Eisenhower and Operation um, Dry Front, but in reverse. The word I will not say because is a slur. 1.3 million people were deported, okay? Mexican-Americans were deported. Americans of Mexican de descent were deported, okay? Put in concentration camps and fucking deported. You understand? He's literally talking about this as though it's a positive thing. Holy fuck, dude. And they were. Nothing like now. You know, I probably got elected in 2016 because of the border. And I told people what was happening, and they understood it. And I won the election, and I won the election, I think, because of the border. Our border is 25 times worse right now than it was in 2016. I had it fixed. To, I had it the last week of my the famous chart that I put up was exactly that. You know the chart? When I looked to the right, I said, there's the chart. Bing. Uh, Bing. That was not a pleasant experience. But the chart that I put up said, and that was done by Border Patrol, that was the lowest number that we've ever had come into our country in recorded history. And we have to get it back to that again. We will. Let me ask you about Project 2025. So you've publicly said that you don't have any direct connection to Project Nothing. I know nothing about it. And they know that, too. Democrats know that. And I purposely haven't read it because I want to say to you, I don't, I have no idea what it's all about. It's easier than saying I read it and, you know, all of the things. No, I purposely haven't read it. And I've heard about it. I've heard about things that are in there that I don't like. And there are some things in there that everybody would like. But there are things that uh, I don't like at all. And I think it's... Uh, unfortunate that they put it out, but it doesn't mean anything because it has nothing to do with me. Project 25 has, it has absolutely nothing to do with me. You posted recently about marijuana and uh, that you're okay with it being legalized, but it has to be done safely. Can you explain your policy there? Well, I just put out a paper. And first of all, medical marijuana has been amazing. It's been I, I've had friends and I've had others and doctors telling me that it's been absolutely amazing, the medical marijuana. And we put out a statement that we can live with the marijuana. It's got to be a certain age, got to be a certain age to buy it. Uh, it's got to be done in a very concerted, lawful way. And the way they're doing it in Florida, I think, is going to be actually good. It's going to be very good. But it's got to be done in a good way. It's got to be done in a clean way. You go into some of these places, like in New York, it's all, it smells all marijuana. You can't, the way you've got to. I fucking hate the Democratic Party, dog. If they, uh, dude, dude, if, if the Democrats lose marijuana to Donald Trump, if Democrats lose marijuana to Donald Trump, I'm going to Brian kill me. Like, like it is such a gimme. It's right there. Oh my fucking God, bro. It's like, ah, ah. Do Democrats not support medical mar marijuana nationally? No, dude, dude. Not one person believes the GOP will pass pro marijuana reform laws. Okay. First of all, I don't think you understand what Trump is doing here, okay? This is the RFK Jr. Joe Rogan podcast audience activation, okay? There are plenty of people who have never voted, who are the dumbest people you've ever seen, not because they've never voted, but just like in general, who only fucking consume these goddamn podcasts, who will literally go, oh, dude, I'm voting for Trump because he said he likes marijuana. He's going to make it legal. He won. Oh, my God. I'm telling you right now, it's like. U.S. files charges against Hamas leadership. That's so funny. That's awesome. <laughs> Remember what I told you yesterday when they said, oh, it's over. Like, you know, this is the last deal that we have. Uh, and then I told you that they're just not going to do anything about Israel. Well, I guess that's, you know, they're doing that.
to have a system where there's control. And I think the way they've done it in Florida is very good. Do you know anything about psychedelics? So I'm, I'm not a drug guy, but I recently did ayahuasca. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of people that speak to sort of the health benefits. And There's already tons of people in weed culture who think Trump legalized hemp, which legalized THCA, a.k.a. normal weed on purpose. He's popular in weed circles more so than you would expect. I mean, that makes sense. They're all fucking potheads that don't know their ass from their elbow. And the spiritual benefits of these different psychedelics. Right. I think uh, we would probably have a better world if everybody... Wasn't the Biden admin trying to reschedule weed? What happened to that? Come on, dog. You know what happened to that. They just fucking dropped it. Everybody in Congress took some mushrooms, perhaps. Um, now, I know you don't... You stay away from all of that stuff. Um, I, I know also veterans use it for dealing with PTSD and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's great, and it's interesting that you're thinking about being more accepting of some of these drugs which don't just have a recreational purpose but a, a medical purpose yeah. a treatment purpose so we put out a statement today we're going to put it that was not very nice okay potheads calm the fuck down okay jesus christ i'm in favor of legalization okay calm down you could do you could smoke all the pot that your heart desires okay calm down this old man said potheads i know i'm fucking the devil's lettuce <laughs> More pahe slander and alcoholic celebration. Yes, I am pro drunk driving and anti anti marijuana. I am a 1960s Democrat or conservative. I'm just a 1960s kind of guy. U.S. poised to ease restrictions on marijuana and historic shift, but it'll remain controlled substance. How much would you smoke in a day? Be honest. I don't. I used to smoke a lot. I don't. Your thoughts on vindication continues. Harris made better decisions before the convention walls than during. Making a nothing will change Biden speech, uh, speech and polling reflects this. Harris got a polling bounce before her convention, not after. How'd that happen? Say weed is cool right now. Dude, I, I cannot begin to tell you how little I give a shit about, like, weed. I don't care. Legalize it. Who gives a fuck? When was the last time you smoked? Years. It's been years. I'm more of a, I'm more of a mushroom guy myself, and even then, I don't really do that a lot either. Um, Like... I feel like this is a conversation that is that has been had a million times over. Who gives a fuck? Like it's not. It's not. People from not legal states care, little bro. No, dog. You don't understand. I'm saying I don't care. As in, like, yeah, of course I'm in favor of legalization. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, as in, it's a done deal. There is no argument against it. I don't agree with any arguments against it. I think that there's no real valid argument against it in general. That's why I'm saying it is a fucking done deal in my mind. That's why I'm criticizing the Democratic Party for not like actively pulling that fucking rope and just being like, we are going to move forward and 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 engage in in rescheduling marijuana in general and and uh, continue forward with legalization process. We're also going to open up a shit ton of people in prison currently for the crime of carrying, uh, the crime of possession, the crime of even distribution, really. It's not even, it's a done deal, and, and I'm criticizing the Democratic Party for being potentially outflanked by the Republican Party, because when Donald Trump says, like, oh, I like weed, it's fine, it's good, it's, it's going to be good, I'm going to vote for it in Florida, all of a sudden, okay, it, don't say it's not outflanking from the eyes of the average people when the fucking federal government or the Democratic Party r routinely does not talk about this at all and runs away from it, it comes across as though... It comes across as though Donald Trump is actually outflanking the megaphonics. When I'm talking about the average American, understand I'm talking about their perception, okay? If you don't hear Joe Biden talk about it, and if you don't hear Kamala Harris talk about it, but you hear Donald Trump talk about it, obviously, from the average per person's perspective, it comes across as though they're the ones outflanking the Democratic Party. It's the same principle. It is the same exact principle behind it is the same exact principle behind why the motherfucker in the chat was saying Donald Trump says he's a peaceful dove. Why would I not vote for him to end wars? Okay? If you don't make it a message that is at the forefront of your campaigning, okay? If you don't put it in any part of your campaigning strategy whatsoever, then of course people are going to go, oh, well, Donald Trump is talking about it. I believe he's going to, you know, 
do the right thing and make marijuana legal or whatever the fuck they ascribe to Donald Trump. Do you not understand what I'm saying here? It's the same issue behind like the railroad strikes. The Biden campaign rarely ever talked about it. The only thing that people remember is the fact that they uh, stopped the strikes legally before they ever happened. They don't know what came afterwards. They don't know that they still continue to engage. They don't know that the Biden campaign still continued to, the Biden administration still continued to engage with the railroads and actually got the wishes of the railroad unions across to the railroad companies. Okay? Campaign low Freudian slip. Oh, must get out another one probably next week. Be more specific, although I think it's pretty specific. And we'll, uh, we'll see how that all goes. That's a referendum coming up in some states, but it's coming up, and we'll see how it does. I will say it's been very hard to beat it. Uh, you take a look at the numbers, it's been very hard to beat it. So I think it'll generally pass, but you want to do it in a safe way. Speaking of marijuana, let me ask you about my good friend Joe Rogan. So you had a bit of tension with him. So when he said nice things about RFK Jr., I think, you've, uh, you've said some not-so-nice things about Joe. I think that was a bit unfair. And as a fan of Joe, I would love to see you do his podcast because he is legit the greatest conversationalist in the world. So yeah. what's, what's the Glaze. story behind well, the tension? I don't think Glaze. there was any tension. And uh, I've always liked him, but I don't know him. I mean... I only see him when I walk into the arena with Dana and I shake his hand. I see him there and I think he's good at what he does, but I don't know about doing his podcast. I mean, I guess I'd do it, but I haven't been asked and I'm not asking them, you know, I'm not asking anybody. It sounds like a challenging negotiation situation. No, it's, it's not. It's not really a negotiation. And he's sort of a liberal guy, I guess, you know, from what I understand. But he likes Kennedy. This was before I found this out before. Kennedy came in with us. He's going to be great. He's doing, Bobby's going to be great. But I like that he likes Kennedy. I do too. You know, he's a different kind of a guy, but he's got some great things going. And uh, I think he's going to be beyond politics. I think he could be quite influential in taking care of some situations that you probably would agree should be taken care of. The Joe Rogan Post is an example. I would love to get your psychology uh, about behind. It's kind of crazy that he just fucking said. Like he's being called, they're mad at him for, uh, Lex Friedman is like the first time he's actually had like any kind of vision, any kind of like contentious adversarial journalism that Lex Friedman is presenting here is because Trump has not sufficiently dick road Joe Rogan. That's awesome. Like, he's like, oh, you said some mean words about Joe Rogan. What's up with that? That's wild, dude. You're Mr. Deals. You've ended, you're Mr. End All Wars. You're Mr. Steal Your Girl. Your bitch bad. Your dick too long. Your smoke too loud. But also, why did you say that about Joe Rogan? Sir, don't you know Joe Rogan is the greatest champion of free flowing conversations, sir? He's the greatest conversationalist of all time. Awesome. Behind the tweets and the posts on truth, uh, are you sometimes being intentionally provocative or are you just speaking your mind? And are there times where you regret some of the truths yeah. you've posted? Yeah, I do. I mean, but not that often, honestly. You know, I do a lot of reposting. The ones you get in trouble with are the reposts because you find down deep they're into some group that uh, He's talking about QAnon. you're not supposed to be reposting. You He's don't even know if those QAnon. groups are good, bad, or indifferent. But the reposts are the ones. How much you want to bet his staffers were like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Don't read truth and repost like, went on supporters like that's a bad look sir we're trying to present you as a moderate sir you're running a general election sir ones that really get you in trouble when you do your own words it's sort of easier but the reposts go very quickly and if you're going to check every single little symbol and uh i don't know it's worked out pretty well for me i tell you it's uh Truth is very powerful, truth. And it's my platform, and it's been very powerful, very, very powerful. It goes everywhere. I call it my typewriter, you know. That's actually my typewriter. What are you doing usually when you're composing a truth? Like, are you chilling back on a couch? Couches, beds. Okay. 
a lot of different things. I mean, like late at <laughs> night and just. just I'd like to do some late at night. You know, I don't, I'm not a huge sleeper, but whenever I do them, um, you know, past like three o'clock, mm -hmm. they criticize you the next day. Trump was up. True thing. Okay. Trump was true thing at three o'clock in the morning. And there should be no problem with that. And then when you think about time zones, how do they know that you're like, you know, in a time zone, like an Eastern zone? So, but, but every time I do it after like two or three o'clock, it's like, why is he doing that? But it's gotten, um, I mean, you know, the truth has become a very successful uh, form. And I like doing it. And it goes everywhere. As soon as I do it, it goes everywhere. The country seems more divided than ever. Yeah. What can you do to help alleviate some of that division? Well, you can get rid of these two people. They're terrible. They're terrible. You don't want to have them running this country. They're not equipped to run it. Joe just, Joe, it's a disaster. Okay. And Kamala, I think she'll end up being worse than him. We'll see. I think a lot's now, you know, the convention's over with. And I, I see I'm leading in just about all the polls now. They had their little honeymoon period, as they call it. And we'll see how that all goes. Who knows? From my personal opinion, I think you, you are at your best when you're talking about a positive vision of the future versus criticizing the other side. Yeah. I think you have to criticize, though. I think, I think they're nasty. They came up with a story that I looked down and I called soldiers that died in World War I suckers and losers. Okay. Now, number one, who would say that? Number two, who would say it to military people? Nobody. It was a made-up story. It was just a made-up story. And they like to repeat it over again. They know it was made up. I have 26 witnesses that nothing was said. They don't want to hear about that. Like she lied on McDonald's. She said that, uh, that she worked at McDonald's. It's not a big lie, but it's a big lie. It's so, you know, I mean, they just went and they checked. And unless she can show something, they don't talk about it. The presses are going to follow up with it, but I, I'll keep hammering it. But she never worked at McDonald's. It was just a, you know, sort of a cool thing to say, hey, I worked at McDonald's, you know. Um, but one of the worst was two days ago, I went to Arlington at the request of people that lost their children. He's awesome. Lex is like, hey, maybe you shouldn't be so contentious. How do you fix the country's divisiveness? He's like, they're suckers. I hate them. We fix it by voting for me. <laughs> Kamala Harris never worked at McDonald's. It's like, what are you saying? I mean, like I said, I don't, I, I'm not like Mr. Fucking give all the reverence and, and respect to Mr. Respecting veterans. I'm not, I'm not Mr. Respect the veterans. Okay. As you guys know, one of my favorite one of my most famous moments is disrespecting a veteran. In my head canon, I like to think that like when um when Fox and Friends talked about it, which was Donald Trump's favorite show at the time, he didn't actually respond and tweet about it because there was a real moment where we were afraid that Donald Trump was gonna see it and say something about 9-11 and how I'm a fucking socialist uh Islamist or whatever the fuck, and then I was gonna get killed. I maybe maybe he just saw it and was like he agreed. <laughs> There'll always be children to those people. You understand that. That's not politically incorrect a thing to say. The mother comes up, I lost my child. But, you know, the child is a soldier. And lost a child because of Biden and because of Kamala. As, just as though they had the gun in their hand because it was so badly handled. It should have been done at Bagram, which is the big air base. It shouldn't have been done at a small little airport right in the middle of town where... People stormed it. Uh, it was a true disaster. And they asked me if I'd come and celebrate with them three years. Three years. They died three years ago. And I said, I'm going to try. I got to know them because I brought them here, actually. One night, they, they almost all came here. And they said, I wonder if Trump will actually come and see us. I heard they were here. I came, set, so we stayed for like four hours listening to music up on a deck right upstairs. Beautiful. And they were great people. So they called me over the last couple of weeks and they said, we're going to have a reunion, our three-year reunion. Would you be able to come? And it was very hard for me to do it logistically, but I said, I'll get it done. And I got there and we had a beautiful 
time. I didn't run away. I didn't, you know, I didn't just walk in, shake hands and walk out like people do. And I wasn't looking at my watch like Joe Biden does. And it was amazing. So I did it for them. I didn't do it for me. I don't need the publicity. You literally are using them as a campaign ad. And you shot a TikTok. You made them throw the thumbs up and smile on the grave of the dude who fucking died. That's so sick. He's so goaded, dude. Damn, this guy's good.